This happened a long time ago. My family and I love going to garage sales and thrift stores. My parents are very friendly and polite and people usually like them pretty quickly. So they've been offered several times to take stuff for free and they've even gotten these types of deals. You can have everything for free, but you have to take all the stuff. So we've ended up with a truck filled with random garage sale items more than once. One time, my mom and I were in her bedroom, checking the loot of one of these types of deals. We were having a good time while sorting all of the stuff. We got to this big trash bag that was filled with dolls. There were lots of them. So I decided to just open the entire bag and put them all out on the bed. We started checking the dolls one by one, choosing which ones to keep for my sister and which ones we should give away and which ones we should throw away. Most of these deals include taking some trash, but we didn't care, it was fun. We have half the bag sorted out. When we get to this tumbling doll that supposedly can do flips, my mom likes it. Looks like new and seems like a fun toy for my sister, so she wants to keep it. She asks me to test it to see the doll tumbling, but the batteries seem to be dead. Tried again with brand new batteries, but still no luck. After a few minutes, I concluded that the doll must be broken and that it didn't work. So I take out the batteries and place the old dead ones back in. I put the doll back on the bed and we keep sorting the items. 15 minutes pass and my mom and I were just taking a break chatting when suddenly we hear this loud noise that sounded like gears and an overcharged motor. We looked at the bed and the sound comes from the doll, the tumbling one. And right in front of both of us, this doll turns its head, looks at me and says, Mama, the movement was so abrupt that I even felt the bed shake a little. My mom and I looked at each other and I saw her face turn ash white. I just punched the doll as hard as I could as a reflex and it landed on the other side of the bedroom. We immediately went to the kitchen to calm down and explain what just happened to my dad. After a few minutes, I go back to the room with my dad to investigate, trying to figure out what had just happened. My mom enters in full rage mode and goes for the doll and puts it in a plastic bag and asks my dad to take it out to the trash out of the house, now. My parents are religious, so after that they prayed and blessed the entire house for almost an hour. I've never seen my mom that scared. It truly felt like a scene from a horror movie. I expected the doll to get up and attack me in that moment. I don't really believe in the paranormal even though I have had a couple of experiences that scared me that I can't explain. Growing up, I always hated dolls and was scared of them, even to the point of having really messed up nightmares about them. Good thing this happened when I was older, around 16, or I'd probably still be traumatized. What still bugs me is that even if I do find some rational explanation for why the doll worked again with dead batteries, with the power switch off and not being touched by anything, the doll wasn't a baby doll. It was a gymnastics doll that was supposed to do flips. As it wasn't new and there was no box, I'll probably never know if saying mama was one of its features. And honestly, I'm okay never knowing. This occurred over 20 years ago, but is still fresh in my mind. My son was born early, at 32 weeks. We were lucky, and he had few issues, and we were able to bring him home a month after he was born. He came home on oxygen and caffeine due to bradycardia. Once we were home, strange things began to happen. The cat refused to go into his room. And before he was born, I was forever removing said cat from his room. Our dog would sit at the bottom of the stairs and tilt his head as if he was listening to something. 
I would be changing his diaper and start talking as I thought his dad had come into the room, only to turn and find out I was alone. A friend gave him a peekaboo big bird toy that would say peekaboo when you covered and then uncovered its eyes. This toy would go off all the time, even after I put it into a box in the closet. I often felt that I was not alone in that house. My parents had given us an angel care baby monitor as a gift. This had a pad that was placed under the mattress and an alarm would sound if it didn't detect any movement after a certain amount of time. As our son was tiny, only five pounds when he came home, this alarm would go off often. I would wake up, walk into his room, turn it off and check on him. He was always fine. And I never felt that it was anything but the fact that he was so tiny that the pad didn't pick up his breathing. During this time, I would often dream of a woman that I would find in his room. I never saw her directly, but I would dream that I saw the shadow of a woman with long hair standing and reaching into his crib. The dreams never scared me, but I did find them very odd yet comforting at the same time. I can't remember how long he'd been home, but it was at least a month. He was still on oxygen and still on caffeine. Our bed was to the left of our bedroom door and I slept on the right hand side next to the door. My husband slept on the left. I was asleep and was awoken by being shaken roughly on the door side of the bed. I woke up and looked over at my husband and said, why are you shaking me? Only to realize he was completely asleep and on the wrong side to have shaken me. I immediately jumped up and ran to my son's room. I flipped on the light, something I had never done to this point, and I heard a gasp from the crib. Often when babies spontaneously stop breathing, you need to startle them to get them to start again. I truly believe that he had stopped breathing and that my turning on the light startled him into breathing again. After this episode, the dreams and the strange occurrences with the pets and toy continued until my son came off the oxygen and caffeine. Once that happened, the odd occurrences stopped, the pets stopped acting weird, and the big bird toy never went off on its own again. I really believe that something or someone came back from the hospital with us to keep him safe. The feeling I got from my dreams was that it was a young woman, maybe early to mid twenties and indigenous. I'm Canadian. I will always be grateful for them watching over him and shaking me awake that night so that I could startle my son into breathing again. I've never really had any paranormal experiences before, but I cannot explain this. I'm in college and about seven other people and I from my school went on a backpacking trip. We had two experienced leaders. We drove to Zaleski State Forest, which is in the Appalachian region of Ohio. It was early April this year and it was cold. Everything was still dead from winter. After hiking miles into the forest, we set up camp at the backpacking campsite. There were a couple of other groups of people as well. A few of them were friendly older couples and then two college aged girls. Everyone was pretty spread out from each other. We set up camp farther away from everyone else. I've always been able to sense energies of places and the energy in this place wasn't great. It was almost spooky. Each of us had individual one person tents and we formed a kind of cluster in this site with my tent being in the back so no one was behind me. Our cluster was also right next to the forest because this backpacking site was like a big cleared off square in the middle of the trees. Fast forward, I'm dead asleep around 2 a.m. 
and I wake up to leaves crunching right by my tent. I hear footsteps walking in circles around my tent. They had a sort of heaviness to them that couldn't be a deer or a dog. Also, it sounded like it was bipedal. I could not make this up. This creature or thing was circling my tent for a long period of time, slowly creeping up to the sides of the tent and then just stopping for periods of time that seemed like forever. Then it would move on, walking around the rest of our tent cluster. I could hear a human-like breathing from the mouth whenever it was close to my tent, like a sort of light heaving. I was shaking, too scared to unzip my tent and investigate. I kid you not, this went on for hours and it seemed to me like I was the only one awake. Out of nowhere, I see an illuminated light shape from my tent, although I couldn't tell what it was from inside my tent because it was all zipped up. It was like a warm glow, and it didn't move, kind of like a flashlight would if you were holding it still. I was paralyzed in fear. I simply couldn't believe that it was an animal. At some point, probably due to sheer exhaustion, I fell asleep, but I could hear the heavy footsteps circling right up until the point that I did. In the morning, I questioned my fellow campers about it, and my leader admitted that she had heard the footsteps and the noises as well, admitting that it was bizarre and that she would have investigated had she not been so groggy. One of the boys in the group said that he also noticed the light that came on, but thought that it was someone else. Not a single person in the group had gotten up to go to the bathroom or turned on a light that night. I've heard things about the Appalachian region being creepy and bizarre, and now I believe it. Some people on Reddit have leaned toward Bigfoot because apparently he's associated with light orbs. I've never really been a Bigfoot believer, but I'm telling you, this didn't feel like just any animal or person or anything I've ever experienced before. So maybe Bigfoot is as good an explanation as any. When I was younger, I used to collect porcelain dolls they were my jam something fierce, and I got them for any sort of gift-giving holiday and just because. I had over 200 of them, ranging from brand new from the store to very old from thrift shops and tag sales. So, of course, some of them were haunted. For the most part, they weren't bad, though. One really liked a little chair I had a different doll in, and would constantly knock it out of it until I put her in it, even though she didn't fit so well. And another that was really old but very pleasant to have around was kind of like a guardian. I felt so much safer with her in my room. But then, there was him. Boy porcelain dolls are hard to come by, so when my stepmom found this cute magician boy at the store, she snagged him for me for some holiday. Now, he was brand new, like fresh from the store, never been opened, and there were more like him. He specifically wasn't special or odd or anything like that. I was thrilled to have him. He had a little stool that his little top hat sat on. He wore a standard little boy outfit with a generic starry magician cape and a black wand with white tips that tied to his hand to make it look like he was waving it. I put him on a shelf that was by the foot of my bed and next to the door, facing out into the room, not at my bed. One of the few open spots I had left for my ever-growing collection. That night, I had trouble sleeping and I had these weird, scary dreams. Nightmares aren't that unusual for me. I used to have them a lot when I was younger, but these were different than my usual ones. Dark and malicious, but still not abnormal. In the morning, he seemed to be facing my bed a bit more than before, 
I chalked it up to forgetting how I had placed him. Whatever, it was fine. The nightmares continued, though, getting worse over the next several nights, until I just couldn't handle it anymore. I'd wake up from something horrific and feel something malevolent staring at me from the doorway of my room, which was basically at the foot of my bed. Somehow, I just knew that it was the magician boy. He gave off this terrible vibe, and the area around where I kept him just felt wrong. I finally told my stepmom what was happening, and that I thought it was the boy, and that I didn't want him anymore. He was too scary. She didn't disbelieve me, but she also said that I was overreacting, and that since boy dolls were so hard to find, she would take him. I said yes, but I thought he should just get out of the house altogether. So she brings him downstairs to her room and sets him with the rest of her dolls, also on a shelf between her bed and the door. That night, she's all snuggled up with her son, who I want to say was about three or four at the time they shared a bed, when he wakes her up in the middle of the night, a little spooked. She asked him what was wrong and he points at the door and says, Mama, who's that? I don't like him. The doll was stored in the attic the next day and sold on eBay a few days later. The weird nightmare stopped once he was gone and the scary man was never seen again. Good luck whoever bought him. This is the true story of my childhood through adult years as I recount it. Rattlesnake Road is an original name to a road that has since been changed. I used it to maintain anonymity. I was born on Long Island, New York, and ever since I can remember, I've had really strange experiences. I was never able to sleep at night, and from a young age, I was always terrified of the dark. Yes, every child is afraid of the dark, but I was afraid for a reason that I was unable to explain until later in life. There are a few stories from while I was there, but I want to fast forward to when I was a little bit older and things began to make sense to me. My family purchased a second home and we moved to Colorado. We lived on a ranch located at the top of a hill that fed into the Rocky Mountains. There wasn't much around us, a few neighbors, our barn with our animals, and thousands of acres of hilly and mountainous terrain that surrounded our family. There was a long dirt road that led to our property, Rattlesnake Road. It was a perfect shot of the scenery leading up to our small three-bedroom home. It was quiet, peaceful, but the land was old. I was about seven years old at the time. This is when I began to understand what I was going through wasn't normal. Our home was small. It was a ranch style house with a three car garage, which took up half of the structure. The other half was built into the hillside where you entered from the front. You walked into the living room and you could see straight out the back sliding doors into the plains. In front of you was the kitchen, old with brick. Straight down the hallway, my room was on the right, my brother's room followed that, and lastly, my parents' room was on the left. The bathrooms connected and were on the right as well, wrapping around to the back of the house. I left the hallway lights on when I slept. I was scared to begin with, but something always felt as though it wasn't just our family there. One night, I was up and I couldn't fall back asleep. My parents and brother were sleeping as well. I could hear them snoring down the hall. My bedroom door was open and I was facing the hallway when suddenly the pull string to my closet made a click and the lights popped on. I could see the light making its way through the slatted shades of my closet accordion doors and my heart began to race. Then they shut off. The air in the room became cold, tense, 
almost as though the oxygen was being siphoned out. The silence set in. I couldn't hear the snoring anymore. I couldn't hear anything. I looked toward the hallway, and there was a short, black static mist. It had no facial features, but what I could see would have been a mouth. It seemed as though it was smiling ear to ear, which paralyzed me with an intense feeling of dread. It passed out my doorway and out of sight, not making a sound. Moments later, I heard what sounded like the door to our garage open and close, and the air lifted. All of my surroundings returned to normal. I knew I was awake. I knew what I had seen there. And it visited me, only to get worse as time went on. That image will be burned into my mind for the rest of my life. It was the summer of 2010, and I was still in high school. My friend's dad invited me with his family to go camping near a lake that was a Native American reservation at one point. We get to the campsite, and my friend and I start experiencing weird things. We got chased by a swarm of ghost bees, and we just started to feel like it wasn't safe to be by ourselves. There was a shaman who was going to tell stories around his campsite, and he was inviting campers to come by that night and listen. When night came, I had to walk a ways to the public restroom at the campsite. I get to the restroom, and a guy comes running out, screaming that there are hornets in the bathroom. I was scared of stinging bugs, so I decided to go in a bush that was about four yards away from the restroom. I start peeing and I start hearing rustling coming from the bush. I shine the flashlight and he has darkish skin with white face paint and he's almost half naked. I jumped back and I screamed and I scraped my elbow. A nearby camper ran over to help me and I told him that I saw a man crouched in the bushes. This dad-like figure shines his flashlight into the bush and dives into the bush. Now, all this happened in a matter of minutes. From me seeing the guy and screaming and the other guy coming to help me, I probably only looked away for a second, but when the guy jumped into the bush, he stands back up and he's holding a rabbit. The guy also found burning sage. He told me what sage was because I didn't even know what it was at the time. He put the rabbit down and told me it was just my imagination or that if I was being truthful, the guy ran away and I shouldn't go alone to the bathroom anymore. I go back to my campsite and my friend's dad asked me what took so long. I didn't tell him what happened. He then tells us that he wants all of us to go to the shaman's camp so we can hear the stories. So we go to the campsite and this guy was dressed to the nines, headdress, necklace, feathers, white face paint, and no, he was not the guy in the bushes. The shaman was probably in his 40s, and he said that his father taught him everything he knows. He told us the history of the lake, and that it was his people's land, and that we took it from them. Literally being honest as can be, and not sugarcoating it for the kids. We killed them and turned their home into a lake, and that his ancestors' bones are in that lake. He then starts telling us about native legends, and he starts talking about skinwalking. He told us that some people in these tribes were so in tune with nature that they could take on the form of other animals, mainly coyotes or dogs, but they can shift into other animals too. I was starting to feel genuinely spooked, and after his whole get-together ended, I told him about what I saw in the bush. He grabbed me by the shoulder, and took me to his trailer and told me to wait outside. He came out with a single red feather and looked at my elbow and told me that I was wounded in battle and that this feather will show the skinwalkers that they should respect me and they will leave me alone. I didn't know what to do, so I took the feather 
and as I walk away, he shouts, They don't show themselves to everyone. I slept pretty good that night, and the rest of the time we stayed after I got that feather. But, like the dumbass kid that I was, I didn't treat it with respect, and I lost the feather not soon after I got back home. I wish I still had it. I'm not saying that skinwalkers exist, but the shaman seemed to take what I said really seriously, and I wanted to share my experience. This is the story of Madeline, the doll that has my face. For context, my mom is the original owner of Madeline, but Madeline has been mine since I was a child. Madeline was bought by my mother about 35 years ago, long before I was born. There's a possibility that she's a lot older than that, as she was secondhand when my mom bought her. These are my experiences with this doll. I'm well aware that creepy doll is a trope, but stay with me. Madeline, I named her, is a porcelain doll with a soft body filled of horse hair, with her hands and feet and face made of plain white porcelain. Her hair, according to a doll expert I had her repaired by a few years ago, is a combination of horse and human. She's about 30 centimeters long, with brown hair, blue eyes, wears a blue cotton dress with embellishments, black leather lace-up boots, and a somewhat Victorian underdress. I believe she was pretty common, a generic doll type. I base this off the fact that I took her to doll shows as a child to find out a little bit more about her, since she doesn't have any marks. And another lady had her almost exact identical replica. Same dress, same colors, hair, and everything. So she must have been pretty common. The only difference? The face. The lady and I compared the dolls, vividly pointing out how my doll's face was almost identical to mine. I'm not saying it's impossible to have dolls who look somewhat similar to you. I mean, that's just good marketing, really. But at the time, I had a jaw problem that required surgery, and the doll's jaw perfectly matched mine. Heavy overbite. This lady's doll didn't at all. Given the dolls had everything else exactly the same except the face, it just sort of makes me wonder if at some point her face had been replaced or repainted before my mom purchased her. I don't believe Madeline to be a harmful entity, but a few strange things have happened that make me wonder. As a child, I kept her on my bed on the top bunk. I had one of those loft beds with a desk under it while I was at school. If someone was to change the sheets, they'd put her back because mom was always worried that the dog would eat her. She was always on my bed and I was the only kid in the house, so I'm the only one who played with her at the time. At school one day, I would have been about 10 years old, I broke my right wrist. Most children will break something in childhood and I had fallen out of a tree. I remember getting home from the hospital at about 8 p.m. and I was a bit dopey from the assistance they'd given me. Because I couldn't climb the bunk in a cast, Mom made me up the mattress on the ground. I had grabbed Madeline so that Mom could move the bed, when suddenly, Madeline's right hand dropped onto the carpet. I would brush this off, but more has happened. Once I needed stitches in my head. I came home and there was a chunk of Madeline's hair gone. I had jaw correction surgery. Now neither of us have an overbite. I've had knee surgery and have a scar on my right foot, and she has just had a crack repaired on her right foot. Mom, who hadn't seen her in a few years, as I've had things in storage, recently made a comment, and it's what made me decide to tell my story. She said, I remember her having a much younger looking face when you were little. Could this doll be aging with me, experiencing things like I am? I really don't know what it means, but I'm interested to hear your thoughts. I 
I lived in an apartment in Hawaii where I had a lot of terrible nightmares. The layout of the apartment went like this. You stepped through the door into the foyer and immediately to your right was the kitchen. To your left was a shoe closet. There was a half counter separating the living room and dining room and to the left of the living room, past the shoe closet, was a T-shaped hall. The shorter hall was at the front and it led to two bedrooms, one at each end, and the long hall that split this short hall went past a full length mirror, washer and dryer, two sinks and ended in the bathroom. This hallway consistently creeped me out. Noises, movements out of the corner of my eye, and a mounting sense of dread every time I stood in the hallway was already starting to manifest, along with a lot of other instances. In order to avoid being scared from my nightmares, I slowly start to become a night owl. This means sleeping all day and staying up all night. Well, one night I decide to shower for whatever reason at a time between midnight and one in the morning, when everyone else in the household is asleep. I start doing my usual routine, starting with washing my hair, when I start to hear a faint noise that wasn't water hitting porcelain. It takes a moment to register what I was hearing. A woman screaming, absolute bloody murder. Anger and horror and anguish are obvious in her voice, but it was so faint I couldn't possibly fathom where it was coming from at first. I turned to look out the tiny window in the corner of the shower, the only form of ventilation in our bathroom, and I think that it can't possibly be coming from there. After all, I live on the 22nd floor. So I'm rinsing the shampoo out of my hair, dwelling on this screaming which is still going on, when I finally pinpoint it. It's coming from the drain, between my feet. Okay, I think. It's probably a neighbor, watching TV, and the noise is just traveling through the pipes. No biggie. I'm fairly convinced of this now, and I'm on that train of thought, wondering who in the world is watching TV while in their bathroom, and wasn't doing that a dangerous thing. As I'm thinking along those lines, as if to retaliate my nonchalant brushing off, the screaming starts to get incrementally louder, of course, I figure somebody's just slowly turning up their TV. It takes seconds to register that the screaming is turning to faint screaming and gargling. It's not a TV. It's literally in the pipes, and it's coming closer, starting to echo as it comes up the drain. Then this thought hits me. What will be here if and when it finally reaches the end of the drain? Fear suddenly washes over me, the sort of fear that led to me shutting the shower off, soap still half in my hair, falling out of the shower in a panic scramble, and backing away as the screaming continues. I don't bother with clothes or a towel. I leave all the lights on for my parents to scold me about in the morning. I didn't care. I ran through the hallway and into my room and locked the door. After that, I never showered again unless somebody was awake. From then on, that little window in the corner of the shower, I could feel someone staring in through it, constantly watching me. Every now and then, if I glanced up at it out of the corner of my eye, I could see the swish of long black hair disappearing out of sight. I hated that apartment, and in some ways, I still do. I was about seven years old, my brother about 10. It was well past our bedtime when our mom woke up off the couch to put us to bed. Our dad worked construction out of town back then, so it was often just us three at the house for weeks at a time. Up the stairs and to the immediate right was our parents' bedroom. Going left put you in the middle of a hallway. Taking another left down that hallway led to my brother's room. The opposite end was my room, which was also across the hall from our upstairs bathroom. At either end of the hallway, 
are windowed doors that we always kept locked and rarely used. The door on my end led to a balcony overlooking our front yard, and the door on my brother's end opened to our back porch. The house kind of leans into a small hill. My brother and mom both had a habit of waking up in the middle of the night to use the bathroom. I only knew this because I was always a light sleeper, and they just couldn't help flushing with the door wide open. This night, however, my brother stopped on his way to his room and came back toward the bathroom. He said, I'm going to try to pee before I go to bed. The past few nights I've been too afraid to walk to the bathroom. I keep seeing a man in stripes at the end of the hall. I don't know if my mom wrote it off as my brother telling ghost stories to try to scare me, or if she was already half asleep and didn't catch it. But she didn't react at all to my brother's confession. I, on the other hand, was terrified by it. The fear of seeing a ghost like that at the end of the hallway, or through the window, is the reason I started running from the stairs to my bedroom at night. Years later, when I was about 18, my mom and I were having a conversation in her car about a dog that we had for a very short time when I was little. We were sharing stories about Max's tendency toward destroying my shoes and other unruly behaviors when my mom blurted out, do you remember that time I opened the front door for the cops and Max ran inside to the kitchen and started tearing open that big bag of dog food we had? This really caught me by surprise because in all the years I lived in that house, we never once called the cops. We were a gun-owning family in a quiet, rural West Virginia neighborhood. And also, nothing had ever really happened that would have required home defense, let alone the cops. I asked her what she was talking about, and she looked equally surprised, as if she had just revealed something by accident. Oh, that's right, she said. I never told you because you were too young at the time. Okay, so one night, I woke up hearing noises outside my window. And when I looked, I saw a man staring into my bedroom. She went on to describe how turning on the lights caused him to take off running, and how she grabbed my dad's pistol before calling the cops. I can't remember all the details I gave them when they showed up, but he was a tall white male wearing a striped shirt and jeans and short dark hair. Something like that she said. They said it matched the description of a man they were looking for in the area. Turns out he had escaped from jail on a murder charge. Now, I know it sounds so obvious hearing those two stories back to back, but this was years apart. And honestly, it wasn't until a few years ago, in my mid-twenties, that I pieced together that my brother had unknowingly warned us about a murderer who spent multiple nights casing our home while we thought he was telling ghost stories. I lived in a 1900 farmhouse in Northern Maine, along the border of Canada. The house was a small, two-story, clapboard-sided farmhouse. The central heat was a giant, handcrafted metal stove. It was large enough to fit a log a foot in diameter and three feet long, and sat in the middle of the dirt-floored basement. The stove was so airtight that you could throw in several chunks of split hardwood and dog it down tight. Then, you crack the air vent just a tiny bit and the fire would smolder all night, with heat drifting up through the vents and ducts. It was the main heat source in the house, although there were two additional cast iron wood stoves. I lived there with my father and his girlfriend. My father would spend a lot of time working on the property, clearing brush. He also worked on scraping the peeling paint and applying a fresh new coat. Although he refused to invest money in the house, so many of his repairs were low quality and incomplete. After I moved away, I stayed away for over 15 years. 
One day, my wife and I were staying at a hotel a few hours away and found ourselves with a free day to randomly explore. We ended up driving back to the area of that house and decided to make it our destination. The area hadn't changed much. The area is very sparse, with a lot of dense trees and large grassy yards and fields, farms here and there. We turned off US Highway 1 onto the road named Wilcox Settlement Road. The house was maybe a quarter mile down that road. The sun was low in the late afternoon sky, a bit above the trees. I pulled up at the end of the driveway, or dooryard as the locals call it, and stopped in the road. The house was a wreck, in much worse shape than when my father had owned it. There were a few beat up cars parked by the house. There were barrels and scrap wood and random old junk all around the yard and on the porch. Much of the siding had been removed, exposing mylar-backed foam insulation boards that had been pressed between the studs in the exterior wall. There was an old, dented, rusty pickup truck parked closest to the road where we sat idling. My foot on the brake, my wife and I sat gaping at the creepy old dilapidated house. The yard was overgrown, and the brush had reclaimed most of what my father had laboriously cleared all those years ago. Movement caught my eye in the dimming light. A waving hand. There was a man standing on the other side of the old pickup truck, and he was slowly waving his arm, beckoning us toward him. He was a large, overweight man, late thirties to mid forties, dressed in a dirty work coat. His mouth was open in a gap-toothed smile, and he stood there, still, except for his upraised right arm, slowly beckoning us to pull into the driveway. I was frightened. First of all, we didn't see him initially, so it caught us off guard to have him standing as close as he was. Secondly, the way he stood there, watching us, beckoning, reminded me of a scene from a backwoods horror film. The man's smile seemed to me a cunning veneer of harmlessness, belied by a bleary, cold glint of greed, or worse. I instinctively floored the accelerator and sped away. I hate that house. It was a very bad place. I felt like it was stained with bleak sadness, fear, and loneliness. I was on patrol one night in my town, and we were told to go to some weird place that none of us had ever heard of. Cernan Lake is how it's pronounced. I haven't been able to find it on any maps after the fact, and we had to be directed by dispatch to a back road, which was barely visible from the highway. Grass had grown over most of it, and you could only see tiny gravel rocks here and there. We're no strangers to small towns out in the middle of nowhere, seeing as there's a ghetto calling itself Lake Annette nearby. Anyway, someone had reported a woman screaming inside of a motel, and two men had gone into the room and not come out. Naturally, this sounds like a pretty big deal. So, we're sent out there and being guided over radio by dispatch. When we get there, it's basically just a set of eight buildings, one of which is a gas station. There were no pumps, and it was basically just a house with a concrete drive-in. The motel is the closest thing to the road. A bunch of people, maybe about nine, were standing outside the motel. Most of the lights inside were on, and at first we didn't hear any screaming. We tried briefly to talk to the people outside about what was going on, but everyone said something along the lines of, I don't know, I just woke up because of all the screaming. Seeing as this was a potentially dangerous situation, I drew my taser, and my partner drew his service pistol in case the taser didn't work for whatever reason. Thick clothing, probe going off too far to one side, something like that. As soon as we open the front door to the motel, the screaming starts up again. It was incredibly painful to the ears and caused us to run to the room from which it was coming. We yelled in that we were the police and we went in. As soon as the door is open, 
the screaming stops. Just gone. The room looks completely ransacked, scratches on the walls. No blood, though. Nothing seems to be missing, just misplaced or damaged. The bathroom was completely clean, no scratches. Closets were empty. We looked under the beds, even, and nothing was there. We poked around for as long as we felt was necessary and radioed in that we didn't find anything. We waited for other people to come out and help. We left and went back to the station and wrote up written reports. We still have absolutely no idea what happened. Investigators don't have any idea, and we haven't heard anything from the lake town since. I've been having sleep paralysis fairly frequently, hearing scratching on the walls and footsteps, as well as nightmares. None of this happened until we went there. I've been working with a psychiatrist to deal with it, currently trying Ambien to see if it'll keep me from experiencing sleep paralysis. I've been tempted to go out there again on my own time, but I haven't been able to work up the nerve. Our department can't afford body cams for everybody since we're a small town department. We can barely afford repairs on our vehicles, so we didn't get any footage. I have no idea what this might have been. I'm leaning towards some kind of elaborate prank, but it just seems odd. Like, it would have taken way too much effort to actually fake it to be worth it. We've seen the guy who owns the so-called gas station coming to our gas stations and filling up gas cans. He puts them in the back of his pickup and drives back toward the highway with him. I also asked around as the post office said that they do occasionally get mail to and from there, but it's mostly tax stuff. I haven't been able to find it on any maps. The view is blocked by trees on Google Earth, and you can't really see the turnoff on the highway. I've been having trouble finding really any official records related to it, aside from a case file from the early 90s, before I was even born, about a textbook domestic disturbance. This happened around the time that I was 11 years old. My dad had just bought a log cabin in the woods of Maine. The place was completely dead, and while we had neighbors, we rarely saw them. We had already spent a few nights up there on a previous trip, about a 250 mile trip just to get there. We decided to take another trip up there for a long weekend. As this cabin was old, my parents decided to get some work done on it to make it more appealing. So they hired people to come and redo some things in the rooms. At the time, there was only one bedroom available for us to sleep in. As night fell, we all got ready to sleep. There were six of us in that one room. Mom, Dad, me, two brothers, and sister. In the middle of the night, I wake up to audibly clear boot steps in the living room. The bedroom was connected to the living room. All that was between us was an old wooden door and a rusty deadbolt lock that would definitely come off if somebody were to kick the door in. As I was still waking up, I was in that foggy state that you are kind of when you're just becoming conscious. I wasn't all there. But then I heard the voice of my sister saying, do you hear that? So now I know that this isn't just part of a dream leaking into reality. I sit up quickly and look to the other bed and both of my parents and my sister are looking at the door and looking at each other. My heart starts to race, not knowing what to think. I then hear my sister say, are we going to die? which really doesn't help the situation at hand. As my other brother starts waking up, the boot steps stop for a moment and then continue. Mind you, there was no fading of the steps, which means that the sound came from a general area. We continue to just look at each other in fear and worry, none of us knowing how or why somebody would get into our cabin. As my last brother begins to wake up, the boot steps stop. My dad then gets out of bed 
and grabs the machete that he placed under the bed and heads toward the door. Placing his ear to the door, slowly, to try to see if he can hear anything else, he can't. Then, in one quick motion, he unlocks and opens the door while wielding his weapon, prepared for anybody that might be there. He walks out into the living room, then to the other rooms to see if anything was there. But everything was clear. As a matter of fact, all the doors and windows were locked. There was no possible entry into the cabin, seeing as nothing had been tampered with. It was really hard to get back to sleep that night. As I woke up that morning, I remembered what had happened the previous night. I remembered hearing those bootsteps, and I even confirmed with my family that it wasn't a dream and that we all experienced the same thing. As there was no possible way that a person could have entered the house, I came to the conclusion that this was paranormal. I had my share of paranormal experiences growing up. My family and I have tried to debunk this a hundred ways, but we just can't come up with a solid solution. If you think you have a reasonable cause for this incident, let me know. And before somebody says it was somebody outside or an animal, no. I know for a fact that the boot steps came from inside the house. This was definitely one of the scariest experiences of my life. When I was 8 to 10 years old in the mid-1990s, my mom worked at a carpet company near Beaufort, Georgia. The building had a storefront where customers could walk through and look at the samples, and in the back there was a huge warehouse where all kinds of flooring was stored. There was a loading and unloading area with large bay doors that opened up to a concrete loading lot. The loading lot was against an overgrown wooded area but the area still had rural housing dotted here and there, so you could see the backs of a few houses a bit away through the woods. In general, the building always gave me the creeps. I would run around the huge hanging carpets in the warehouse while my mom was working up front. One day, while I was waiting for my mom to get off work, the big bay doors were opened, so I went out in the loading area to play outside. After a few minutes, I heard what sounded like a train coming down the tracks. Of course, when you're a kid, you get really excited about that stuff. So I ran out a little farther into the loading lot. Sure enough, I heard a train horn and I could see a train coming down the tracks from the right of the building. I put my hands over my eyes to shield them from the sun so I could see better and I watched this robin egg blue, shiny metal train coming down the track. I remember seeing a lot of rivets. At the time I called them screws because I didn't know what rivets were. On the train and windows that came down, not up. Specifically, I saw people sitting in it and especially a lot of ladies with these kind of round looking hats and a kid running down the middle of the train car. I saw a man smoking a pipe, and I remembered thinking, must be in the smoking section. To give you a better idea, the train front was rounded and the cars were rectangular. The robin egg blue was in some details, like one of the panels under each window, stripes going up the front, and a few other small areas. The rest was really shiny, like metal. It seemed like one long train, because the cars were attached really close together. I watched this train pass by and I was really excited about it. It seemed like my mom came out almost right after it passed to tell me she was ready to leave. I said, I saw the train, it just passed by. She was really confused and told me that there were no trains that passed there. I lamented that there most definitely was a train and I told her everything about it. She said, there's no train that can even come back here. 
The train tracks end right down there. I seriously thought she was pulling my leg. So I laughed and I said, uh-uh. I ran down there and sure enough, the train track ran out of track just around a bend that wasn't visible from the lot. I swore to her that I had just seen the train pass by and she swore, of course, that I was making it up. As I thought about it, I couldn't really say that I saw any specific facial features of the people on the train though. I remembered the hats, the kid, the pipe smoking, but I couldn't remember what a single face looked like. I kind of dropped it because, yeah, the tracks clearly ended and a train couldn't have gone through. But I brought it up to her and explained the detail of the train again in recent years. She thought I had made it up and couldn't believe the details, but I remember all these years later, and I think she kind of got spooked by it because she finally admitted that she also felt creepy in that building sometimes. In Sydney, there's this National Park Drive where people complete runs which consist of trying to complete the drives within a timestamp. I've been doing these so-called Nasho runs for a while now with my best friend. Nothing has ever happened before, and the drive through the park is spooky at night, sure, but I've always found comfort in the woodlands or in night drives, so I never really thought anything of it. A few nights ago, Three of my friends and I went for a Nasho run, and exactly at the halfway point, we hit a pothole pretty hard, which resulted in a flat tire, so we pulled over to the side on a long road. This place has no reception, and it's in the middle of nowhere, with no way of walking through or back. We had a spare tire, but no change kit, so I had one friend on call for help which was a pain due to the lack of reception. My best friend panics a lot, so she was on the verge of crying, and I was rummaging through the boot for a wrench and a jack. About 20 meters away was a parked car, which was strange because the last house we passed was about a kilometer away, but we just shrugged it off. Later on in the dead of night, we hear a group of friends laughing, and this spooked my friends so they stayed in the car. I told them I was going to follow the laughter and ask if they had a change kit in their parked car. Nate insisted on coming with me. We walked 20 meters to the parked car and nobody was in there. It gets pretty freaking dark, so I tell him to turn on his flashlight, which he does. We turn a corner on a gravel road and once we do, we see a woman standing there with her back toward us. The group laughter had stopped which left us in the dead of night, in complete silence, in the middle of nowhere, with this random woman who was just standing there. But she looked pretty normal to me, so I approached her slowly. I said, hey. She didn't turn around or react at all. So I stopped in my tracks, but Nate continued walking toward her. He stopped about five meters away behind her. I yelled out, oi. And again, she didn't turn around. We weren't able to see her face, but something just wasn't right. She was tall, in all white, but I looked at Nate and he just stood there and under his breath, he muttered my name and told me to go repeatedly. So I turned around and started walking back. By the time we passed the car, we started running back to our car. We sat inside and I asked what happened and he said that something was wrong because a woman just shouldn't be standing there by herself in pitch darkness in the middle of a gravel road. In addition to that, she didn't react to us or our source of light. He said he just felt ominous about it all. We told our other two friends and Nate was very shaken up. They sort of laughed it off. And when we ended up finally changing the tire, we turned the car back around and stopped right where we had seen the woman. I rolled the window down and shined my flashlight on the gravel road. The woman was gone though, 
No more laughter, just silence. I thought maybe I had imagined her, but we stood right there, and Nate was right behind her. However, every single one of us heard the group laughter, and there's a fair share of paranormal stories about this area. But up until then, I'd never really paid attention to it. I know it doesn't sound like much, but at the time, it was so crazy. Something just felt so, so wrong. And the way the laughter got relatively loud the closer we got but then came to a total halt once we saw her, something was just wrong. I will never forget this Wednesday night as long as I live. It was the summer before seventh grade, sometime in July. It was Wednesday night, early Thursday morning. The evening before, my family had watched the old school show, Unsolved Mysteries. I awoke in the night, lying on my right side, awake, but my eyes still shut, completely silent. None of us ran fans back then to aid in sleep. I was awake and basically waiting to fall back asleep again. However, I decided to open my eyes. On the right side of my bed, right there, was a being seemingly fixated on a plush bear that I kept in bed with me. And this being fit all of the descriptions that I've always heard or watched on television of an alien. Shorter, pale gray skin, and those awful eyes, huge, black, and slanted, staring at my bear, right by my bed. Honestly, I cannot put into words how I felt right at that moment. I was only just about 12. At some point, I pulled my covers over my head and felt an awful rushing through my body of super warm, then cool, then warm again. Only later in my life did I understand that I was most likely feeling shock. I couldn't scream. I felt frozen. Too scared to scream, maybe. What if I did scream? My mother and stepfather and two brothers would hear me. What the heck would they do if they came running into my room and saw this thing. What would it do? Is it going to kill me? Abduct me? What if it already had and it was returning me? All of these thoughts plus a million more just raced through my young mind. It's awful just recounting it all. Again, how could I ever forget something traumatic like this? So, being such a brave 11-year-old and after what felt like 12 hours, I decided to try and scare it. I decided that I would thrash my legs up and down from under my covers as hard as I could. I know, horrifying, right? I was so petrified, though. So I did this and then remained under my covers, just waiting. Nothing happened. So I stayed under the covers. This had to be at least close to going on two hours from when I first opened my eyes and saw this thing. As I lay wide awake, I heard a noise. To this day, I still can't explain exactly how it sounded. The sound felt as if it surrounded me and was coming from outside. It was crisp, clean sounding, maybe mechanical, but maybe not, lasting only about two seconds a sound that I had definitely never heard before and have never heard since. As soon as I heard the sound, something in my mind told me, oh, they're gone. As crazy as it sounds, I firmly believed that the sound was their transportation leaving. Needless to say, I didn't sleep the rest of the night or early morning. It took me so long to confide in my family about this terribly scary incident. Of course, they did not believe me. However, now, from time to time, my mother will mention it and suggest that maybe that's why I suffer from insomnia now. Very well could be. 
This is the first time that I've shared this story publicly, though, and it would be reassuring to hear any other stories of similar happenings. There's this forest near my house in the southeast of England that my friends and I use for mountain biking, but it's got this very uncomfortable, strange vibe to it. The only person we ever see here is the same older man walking his dog, but he always appears when we're feeling really uneasy due to the energy. He'll suddenly just walk past and you never see him coming. There's a tree that has become a memorial for a dog that died, coincidentally a German Shepherd, the same breed as the man has and looks very similar too. Sometimes in the farthest corners of the woods, I distinctly hear a dog collar behind me or nearby. Here's where things get a bit strange. There's a spot we use for campfires and drinking. We were there late at night, around 9 to 10 p.m but gradually began feeling creeped out as the energy started to increase. We started hearing a very strange noise. It was definitely not a fox or a bird. It sounded very sweet and innocent at first until it turned into a blood curdling shrieking. We quickly packed our stuff and went on a mission to get the hell out of Dodge. There's a field that serves as the main access point to the woods. We were using the main path through it and got an overwhelming sense of dread, sadness, and almost anger all mixed together. In the bushes to the side of the path, we heard running, very heavy running. And all of a sudden we started hearing the most horrible growling and screaming noises, getting worse and worse until we got to the exit of the field and it all stopped. We didn't hear it run away but all the noises and running just stopped. We all had strange dreams that night. One time I heard very heavy running footsteps in the bushes right behind me while my friend was having a pee. I turned around to see if it was him, but there's no way it was because he hadn't moved from his spot. He came back and asked if I had heard the running too. Two days ago, I went back there for the first time in around five months alone, as I moved away from the local area. The strange feeling was still there, and in some areas felt like it had gotten worse, but I didn't let it bother me. I went back again today, and there was heavy rainfall the last couple of days, so the ground is very muddy. I kept hearing the dog collar that follows me around, and I noticed strange hoof marks in the ground but they were very inconsistent. Groups of them would appear and then there wouldn't be any more until 15 to 20 meters up the path. They definitely weren't there two days ago and these woods take so long to get into, many people wouldn't bother going there and it's impossible to get a horse in there. I have a few theories about this forest. One, I think it could be a similar presence to Goatman as he was often linked to canine deaths. The potential cryptid activity and hoof marks are consistent with this theory. Two, very unlikely but plausible, it could be the devil's hoof marks. The presence feels very demonic. Third, the forest is potentially a dumping ground for bodies. There was a suspected murder in the local town and police searched the woods. It would explain the strange presence, but not the cryptid activity. Or four, People with dirt bikes sometimes use the forest. Maybe one of them could have died there and haunts us. People have told me that it's just a deer, but that is impossible. We don't get them around these parts at all. I've literally never seen one. I just have no idea what it is that we witnessed. When she was just 11 years old, 
Reddit user SimpleLeaf96396 his dad rebuilt their home. However, brand new as it was, he didn't stop something uninvited from checking out her new bedroom. Here's the story. I grew up as an only child. My parents had my sister when I was 11. Before she was born, my dad rebuilt our bungalow into a huge two-story house. Hence, no one had died in my new bedroom. I'm in my mid-twenties now, but when I was around seven, I started getting a lot of nightmares about the concept of death. I would wake up in the middle of the night crying for weeks on end, and then it would stop for a while before starting up again. By the age of 10, this developed into a feeling of being watched, being unable to sleep, and being convinced that something, not someone but something, was watching me from a specific corner of my room. My new room, the one that my dad had built. My dad eventually ripped that section of wall out to show me that there was a space there. I don't remember why, but there was a space all the way around the upstairs. He had tried to turn it into a fun den area for me, but I hated it, and I wouldn't go in there. This continued until I was about 12, when I got my first smartphone. The iPhone was my dad's old one, but it worked just fine. That was until it got dark outside, and the phone would start typing random letters when I was texting or typing to someone. This only ever happened in my bedroom. As soon as I would go out of the room, it stopped. I told my dad, and he said that it must be damaged, and he bought me a new one for my 13th birthday. He believes in ghosts, but he couldn't explain what was happening in that room that he had built. The new phone did the same thing. I thought I was going mad. I bought some spell candles from a witchcraft museum when we went on holiday. I was about 14. I used them to politely ask whoever or whatever was there to please leave the house peacefully. This seemed to work, and I was perfectly okay in that room again. I slept fine, my phones were all fine as I upgraded and got new ones, and I moved out when I was 20. I went to visit my parents and stayed the night in my old room. Whatever was there when I was a child is back. That same corner, that same feeling, the same dark energy, the same creature. Except now I have an image of it, burned into my memory, despite never actually seeing it. It's a dark creature. It has some type of human shape, but very muscular and it crawls around on all fours, legs bent behind it. Almost wolfish, but without a snout. It snarls and glares, dark red eyes with big black pupils, and it has horns as well. Big horns curved back over its head. There's some type of red tinge to it, but I can't identify where it comes from. But there you go. That's my story. Believe me or don't, it doesn't matter to me. But I don't go into that room anymore when I see my parents. Not even in the daytime. This is a story of my first encounter with the paranormal that I can remember. I was about eight or nine years old, and I was playing with my little cousins at their parents' house during a family gathering. Behind their house is a large forest located in Northeast Florida. My cousins, their neighbor and I, were playing hide and seek in the forest. The only rule their parents had was to stay within sight of the house. Of course, we didn't listen. I was getting bored of the game, and I wanted to do some exploring. I convinced the other kids to join me as we headed deeper into the forest. I noticed this ball of light floating in midair. I thought I was seeing things. I remember rubbing my eyes, just to make sure that it wasn't in my head. I asked my cousins if they saw it too, 
and when I pointed it out, they confirmed that it was there. It was bright and bobbed back and forth, changing from a yellowish color to a transparent green hue. We followed it for I can't remember how long, but we reached a small cabin and the orb disappeared. It was dusk at this point and curiosity got the better of me. My cousins and the neighbor kid were too scared to go up to it, but I did and I peeked inside the window. I saw a dim light inside and what I thought was a human skull sitting on a table next to some jars. Then a shadow from within moved across the far wall. I got chills and signaled to the other kids to run back the way we had come and I took off immediately behind them. We ran as fast as we could and we didn't stop until we were inside the house and I locked the door behind us. I remember getting in trouble because our parents couldn't see us from the kitchen window. I didn't tell my mom or anyone else what we saw because I didn't want to scare my cousins or worry our parents. To be frank, I'm not even sure what I saw or if what I think I saw was there. Later that night, I woke up to the sounds of helicopters and dogs barking outside. It was well past midnight and I asked my mom, who was standing in the kitchen with the rest of the adults, what was going on. The adults had stayed over after the party and they were all just standing there, their eyes glued to whatever was happening in the backyard. I stood there and tried to peek through the kitchen window with them. My mom says that they found the body of a woman in the forest and a cabin where her killer was staying. There was a manhunt going on. I remember not being able to sleep for the rest of the night. The glaring white lights that shine through the folds of the blinds from the helicopter was only one of the reasons. I'm still not sure what that orb was. Maybe it was the spirit of the woman who was trying to lead someone to her killer, or maybe it was something more nefarious. I'm not even sure if one of the other kids told anyone about the cabin that we had seen. Maybe they did, and maybe one of their parents called the police. I just remember us not being allowed to even go near the tree line anymore whenever we visited after that night. I never wanted to anyway. I'm 24 now and have had many other experiences since then, but this is the one that I actually forgot about and was reminded of recently when reading up on Will-O-Wisps. I just thought I would share where it all began for me. This story happened a long time ago, but I still remember it like it was yesterday, and so does my cousin. Our families were very close growing up. We were there often, usually just watching movies. We were young, and this was around the time that the killer clown thing was happening. So when we would watch movies, they would usually be horror. The Conjuring, Annabelle, etc. I was about 12 at the time, my cousin was 14, her brother was 12, and my brother was 8. We were in their basement one night while our parents and older siblings went out for the night. Babysitters weren't something we had. It was lock the doors, stay together, and don't answer the phone. My cousin's basement had a TV in the corner of the room, and on the same wall was a projector. My cousin, 12-year-old boy, and my brother had the hockey game playing on TV and Call of Duty on the projector, while my cousin and I, she was a 14-year-old girl, were sitting shoulder to shoulder on the couch, back to the wall with our headphones in, watching videos on our phones. Our brothers decided they were hungry and turned on the lights as they went upstairs to find something to eat. My cousin and I sat for about five minutes before her brother's bedroom door in the basement slowly closed. When the door came to a full close, the lights in the room turned off, along with the projector and the TV. 
I paused the video that I was watching on YouTube and first assumed that it was a power outage as I didn't believe in ghosts. But when I checked my battery, I saw that my iPod was still charging. Before I could do anything, I heard the sound of my brother and cousin laughing, almost giggling behind my head as if they were right behind my ear. But it sounded off. It didn't sound exactly like them. It creeped me out and my head shot up and toward my cousin, who was already looking at me with her eyes wide. Like I said, we were backed up to a wall, so there's no way anybody could have been behind us. Neither of us missed a second to get up and run upstairs. The first thing we did when we got up there was to look at each other. I said, you heard it too? She agreed, explaining to me what she had heard, which was exactly what I had also heard. We walked toward the kitchen and saw her brother. We explained to him what had happened. He didn't believe us and told us that my brother had been on the third floor bathroom ever since they left and they didn't talk or laugh. This creeped out my cousin and I even more. And when he went downstairs, everything was turned back on and the bedroom door was open. We talk about that night every few years and it still creeps us out to this day. I'm not sure if I'm haunted or something, but I do have a lot of ghost stories that started happening after that night. Kids that I babysit keep telling me that they see things around me, or similar things from that night will happen to me in my basement, with or without other people there. Whenever I tell people about these events, they seem to have something happen to them afterwards and stories come back to me. Usually the ones who joked about what happened or didn't believe in it had an encounter. I think something followed me out of her basement that day, but I don't know if it's evil, if that's possible. I still can't really explain it. It's just odd. The summer before last, my boyfriend and I took a road trip to Omaha, Nebraska, with the main purpose being to visit the Museum of Shadows. We're both somewhere between believer and skeptic and thought that it would be a great experience for us. Leaning in, he even paid the $20 to rent a spirit box to use as we walked around the museum. If you haven't visited the Museum of Shadows, I'd recommend it, even if only because I found it very cathartic. It's mostly dolls with tragic stories attached to them, but walking around reading all the stories of suffering and sadness that families associated with many of these items was very heart opening for lack of a better word. Some items I felt were just creepy and that's where people's associations of hauntings came from when they owned them. I believe sometimes people create their own hauntings by just simply being afraid of an object same with the dolls owned by children who had passed. The families are just so saddened and grief-stricken that they begin to assign their child's spirit to those items. It's so sad, but it really made me feel a great connection to people that I didn't even know, which I think is great for the spirit, however sad. So our spirit box wasn't giving us anything, literally not a single intelligible word. We weren't angry or disappointed, it was sort of a neat if we hear something, but understandable if we don't sort of thing, because we sort of assumed a majority of the items in there could not be haunted. They've got this doll, Demas, and when I say my heart rate increased just by typing her name, I'm not lying. She lives in a chicken wire cage toward the back of the first floor of the museum, and she is scary looking, not a normal looking doll. I got uneasy when I just saw her, and this is in a building full of frightening dolls. Maybe that's intentional though. Maybe they put her in a cage to raise your apprehension. There is a sign above her that says if you choose to speak to her, always say goodbye, which of course you should do with any spirit, I guess. But Demas is apparently particularly malicious. 
I'm a pretty bold soul, so as we're standing there together with the spirit box, I decided I wanted to talk with her. Hello, I said, and the spirit box just kept clicking. I didn't know what to talk to her about, but I'm always worried about lost spirits, so I decided to ask, are you okay? Without hesitation, the spirit box said, Amanda, extremely clearly. My boyfriend and I both heard it. I said, did it just? And he was like, yes, it absolutely just said your name. I said above that I was brave, but I was also immediately filled with a sense of dread. Something about it saying my name and that we'd gotten absolutely nothing else out of that box the entire time we were there was terrifying. And I do not scare easily. I didn't continue the conversation. I just said goodbye and ushered my boyfriend away from her because I was so uncomfortable with her following that. Just now I went through their Facebook feed to see if I still felt the same about her and even saw an event where they let people hold her. I've never felt so appalled seeing such innocent looking photographs. That doll is the only item I have ever encountered that I am 100% sure is haunted and maybe even malicious. I started going to a new school in the second grade. The cafeteria was downstairs in the basement and then there was a long, empty hallway that led to the two bathrooms. I remember the first time I went to the bathroom there. Nobody told me it was haunted, so on the first day of second grade, I ventured down the hall to go to the bathroom. As I made my way toward it, I kept hearing this noise. It was like, ooh, ooh, over and over. When I approached the doorway, so much negative energy hit me that I knew not to go in there. I ran back to the cafeteria, told some girls about it, and they were like, oh yeah, it's haunted. We were all terrified of this bathroom. The boys said that their bathroom was fine, but that the girls' bathroom down there also freaked them out, even to be near it. It got so bad that we had to have the principal come and talk to our class about it. Everyone knew it was haunted. Flash forward to third grade. It was Halloween, and I was the first student in the classroom. Every Halloween, we had a parade outside where we would all march around in our costumes. I began putting my costume on over my clothes, and I noticed a piece of paper folded up on my desk. It caught my eye. I don't know how to describe it, but it was folded strangely. I picked it up, unfolded it, and in a faint handwriting was, if you dare go to the bathrooms downstairs, I'll kill you. I can't make this up. I was the first student in the classroom. The previous day, I had left school in line with everyone else. Once more kids came into the classroom, I told my friends and they were more scared than I was. They made me tell the teacher. You could tell that she thought it was odd but she crumpled up the paper and threw it away, and that's the last time I saw it. I went in the bathroom again, but only in large groups. We used to have a thing called field day, where we played outside all day at the end of the school year. One day on a field day, about 10 other girls and I had to go to the bathroom, so we all teamed up and went to the one downstairs. I remember leaning up against the wall and feeling and hearing something. It was like somebody was banging on the wall with an ax. We all heard it and it was uncomfortably loud. I also have to add that no one ever went into the last stall, but this day a girl did. I mean, it had cobwebs all over it and everything. Literally nobody would use it. Then one night I was at the school for a concert. This was toward the end of fifth grade so I was brave enough to go there by myself. I was kind of curious. I went down to the hall, and as usual, that whoa sound could be heard a mile away. 
I went into the bathroom, but I just kind of stood around. I didn't actually go into a stall or anything. Suddenly, I just got scared and I ran toward the door, but I was rather surprised when I bumped into a strange lady with long gray hair, a scarf partially covering her head and face. I just brushed by her and ran. Also, the lights have turned off when I was in that bathroom. The energy in there is just insane. You just feel in danger. Girls would cry and sob because they didn't want to have to use that bathroom. The loud, overwhelming sound and the occasional banging noises, that unused last stall, the scratches on the mirror, the old poster on the wall, all of it was just creepy. That note might have been a prank, but that bathroom is haunted. My grandparents used to live in the Ozarks in a tiny house in the woods. I loved it there. Being from West Texas, it was always nice to resort to a place with trees. After a year or two of living in the house, my grandparents decided to renovate it to make it look like a log cabin. I had always felt something really unsettling about the house and I warned them to be careful because renovating the house could stir up unpleased spirits. They went ahead with the renovations, gorgeous woodwork on the house with two beautiful decks looking out onto the mountains and an entire new living area in the basement. It was so pretty and I was really excited to stay there in the summer. When I arrived though, the atmosphere was tense it felt angry, even though my grandparents were very welcoming. It was quite strange. I got an official tour, and for the most part, the interior was the same. Then we went to the basement. I was overwhelmed with fear. I was hesitant to go down alone, and when I would, I could never stay for long. I always slept upstairs. I never felt safe down there. One day, I was making my way down the stairs to get some laundry, which was located across from the basement. I had only taken about three steps down when I suddenly felt cold and couldn't move. I just felt petrified. It wasn't too long before I felt a force on my back, and the next thing I knew, I was sliding down the stairs. I was still so petrified that I couldn't even scream. It was a silent fall. When I could move again, I rushed for my clothes and ran back up the stairs, and I didn't go back down for days. A week or so went by. It was July 3rd. It was storming all day, but still pretty warm outside. My grandparents had left for a party down the street, and I had decided to stay and hold down the fort, all alone. I was upstairs in their big open loft on their computer, just killing some time. It was still storming outside, and it was the last moments of daylight. I was listening to music with headphones over my head, browsing YouTube and the like. I felt a familiar cold breeze, but instead of my entire body, it was just my neck. And instead of it being extended like wind, it was brief. It was like somebody was right behind me and just blew on my neck. I wasn't moving. I was too scared to even breathe. I just stayed still, the headphones still on my head. All of a sudden, my headphones flew off with such force that they hit the computer screen in front of me. I screamed, ran, and panicked. I tried turning on the TV, but... All it was was startling loud static. I tried turning it off, but it wouldn't. Trying to calm my nerves, I looked at a painting of a meadow that my grandparents had hanging by the TV, and I saw it. I saw a man with the most sinister evil face I've ever seen, with empty white eyes. I felt so much fear staring into them 
Trust me, he'd never been there before. I ran outside in the rain, shoeless and terrified. I walked to the house where my grandparents were, and I never explained what happened. When I was 17, my 13-year-old sister died. I was moved out and living in Michigan at the time, and she was living with our mother in Texas. She and a friend that was staying the night with her snuck out to meet her friend's boyfriend, and at 1.50 a.m. in the middle of downtown, she was struck by an oncoming train and died. A little side note that I find strange is that that night, I had the feeling that something was coming. I was too afraid to sleep. I left the light on all night and I pushed my mattress far to one side so that I could line the bed frame with my crystals and hopefully protect myself from whatever was coming. I messaged a few of my friends even, telling them to stay safe. It never crossed my mind that my younger sister was in danger. At 5 a.m., I'm up watching TV with my roommate and my mom calls. She asks if I'm sitting down. I run into my room and sit, and I ask her what's up. She tells me that Nan is dead and explains what happened. I swear my soul left my body for a moment. I heard my own screams like I was underwater. I barely remember the rest of the day, but I was able to go pack and I was on my way to Texas in a plane very early the next morning. I listened to how it's going to be on repeat for the whole ride. When I finally made it to my mom's, I bypassed everybody and went into my sister's room and sat on her bed, soaking up the last of her scent. The week was a blur. I held my mother, wrote the obituary. My older sisters and I planned her memorial. I wove together a crown of flowers from our yard for her to wear while she was cremated. I don't think any of us ate a single morsel of food, despite loving community members pummeling us with casseroles. Exactly seven days after her death, nearly to the minute, my older sisters and I were hiding behind the garage sharing a smoke. There was a light directly above us, illuminating the space we were in, and shrouding the rest of the farm in an even blacker darkness. Suddenly I hear, Josie's on a vacation far away, come around and talk it over. So many things that I want to say, you know I like my girls a little bit older quietly at first. We all joined in for the chorus, confirming that they heard this song as well, and the next verse was louder. We joined in for the chorus again, and she's louder still, surrounding us. It sounded like she was singing from the darkness, directly next to the garage, and inching closer with every word. She sings the entire song, and then suddenly my sisters take off running and I follow. It's strange, I was scared. I mean, I was sure it was my sister, and yet I felt fearful. We all run inside and stand in the dimly lit living room, talking over what just happened. Two of my sisters swear that it was my mother singing, on top of our old windmill, so the sound was traveling. My other sister and I swear it was Nan. One of my sisters creeps upstairs to check on my mother, and she's fast asleep. At this point, we all run outside, shrieking Nan's name into the dark, trying to get her to come back. She doesn't. We googled the song lyrics and they were just absolutely perfect for expressing what she was trying to. She sang the whole thing, loud and clear. It still rocks me whenever I think about it. Absolutely crazy and unbelievable. Sometime in the early 1980s, my family lived in Arizona, as my father was stationed at an army base near Sierra Vista, which is some 70 or so miles south of Tucson. My father, myself, our neighbor, and his three sons were going to lend a hand in the construction of the neighbor's friend's home in the desert, a little over the halfway point 
between Sierra Vista and Tucson. I'm not sure what a couple of teenagers and a couple of eight-year-old boys were supposed to do, but we were going to be camping in the desert over the weekend. So it was an adventure to me and quality time with my father. For the sake of anonymity and to make explanations easier, we'll call their father Jerry, the eldest brother James, the second oldest Mike, and the youngest Tommy. At any rate, we got to where the site was and we set up camp. Our dads and Jerry's buddies headed out to get some pizzas from the Benson, the closest town to us, close to a half hour away. It was about an hour before dusk and the four of us still at camp were just sitting around a campfire telling stories. The sun had now set and we were checking out the stars that were starting to come into view. Tommy and I hadn't really noticed anything until James had told us to get in the tent as he got up and pulled a rifle out of Jerry's truck. Quickly looking around, we took notice of several pairs of eyes just beyond the reaches of the campfire's light. There was a pack of coyotes all around the camp. Tommy and I made a mad dash for the tent and hunkered down inside, peering out at these watchful eyes through little mesh windows. That's when I noticed something odd. One of these coyotes wasn't like the rest of them. Its eyes seemed to be farther up off the ground than those of the others. The eyes were a deeper yet brighter shade than that of the other coyotes. The campfire made them all appear as silhouettes against the desert backdrop, but this one was much larger. To make it even stranger, the group of coyotes on one side of the camp were pretty much evenly spaced apart but the ones that I was looking at seemed to be farther away from the odd one. It was almost like they were intentionally keeping their distance from it. I'm not entirely sure what I was seeing, but I seemed to instinctively know that what I was looking at was not a coyote. Tommy and I were both scared, but we were scared for different reasons. I was so terrified, I was practically trying to get as low to the ground as I could while still keeping an eye on this odd coyote. If I could have gone past the bottom lining of the tent and buried myself in the sand, I would have. I heard the crack of the rifle as James sent around toward one of the groups. They scattered, but not the odd one. He stood his ground, didn't move an inch. James sent another round off toward the odd one. It flinched and stepped back a few feet. I don't know if he hit it or not. I just know that it scared the crap out of me, and I wanted it to go away. Moments later, the headlights of my dad's van came into view, and this odd coyote, along with the others, ran off. I didn't want to accept the explanation of just coyote, but I did, simply because I didn't know what it was, and I wanted to convince myself that I didn't see what I did. This was one of the few times that I have encountered something that terrified me. Some 30 years later and a whole lot of research, and I'm pretty sure I know what I saw. I just don't want to come out and say it. I honestly don't know how to put this or where to begin. And now that I think of it, I don't know who would believe this, but it's true. This happened two years ago when I enlisted into the army and I did my basic training at Fort Benning, Georgia. At the beginning of the cycle, it seemed normal, nothing out of the ordinary until white phase had started. I will only share four experiences to avoid this being too long. So hopefully you at least enjoy the stories whether or not you believe me is up to you. Experience one. One day, I was a battle buddy for one of my friends who had passed out due to the heat. So he had to stay at the bay for a little while. We were on the other end of the bay that has 55 bunks in it. My roster number was 340 and he was 342. So we were sitting by our bunks talking about random stuff when out of the blue, one of the locks on the 301's locker jingled out of nowhere. 
Now keep in mind, we're the only ones in the bay, let alone the entire company area, because the others are out training. We stop what we're talking about and he asks me to go check it out. I say no, so we check under the bunks and nobody's there. Experience two. The second incident happened one night when I woke up at about one in the morning. I slept on the bottom bunk and the way that I slept had my head facing the middle of the bay. In front of our bunks was a blue tape line where we would have to line up for different purposes. So I woke up and looked toward the middle and I thought I saw outlines of people walking back and forth. At least four or five people passed my bunk, or so I thought. I hopped up and threw on my boots and began to tow the line. Then the fire guard came up to me and asked me what I was doing. When I told him what I saw, he said that there was nobody else awake and I should get some sleep. Experience three. This incident happened a few nights after the second one. Again, I woke up at about one o'clock in the morning, but this time it was different. I didn't see anybody walking around. Instead, I physically saw a shadow figure sitting at the edge of my bunk. I knew it wasn't one of the others because it was pitch dark, the shadow I mean. The figure was darker than dark. I just kind of froze up and tried getting the attention of the guy next to me, but he wasn't having it. Eventually, the figure faded away right in front of me, but it was still pretty creepy. This last experience I'll tell you isn't too serious, but it's still weird. One day I was in the latrine and I was shaving and getting ready for the day before anyone else had woken up. Then, randomly, all the paper towel machines, which are motion activated, went off one by one. I checked to see if anybody had come in, but I knew nobody did. I would have heard the door and footsteps, but I was just trying to convince myself that there was some kind of an explanation. These are four of the weird and creepy things that happened to me at basic. For disclosure, I'm not crazy, and I also don't know how to explain any of this. I mainly give credit to it most likely being the stress getting to me. I'm not the only one who had experiences though. These are just mine. Even the drill sergeants had experiences of their own that they told us. So are there ghost recruits wandering around the training areas? Maybe. This happened back one summer when I was about 12 or 13, before cell phones were common. My mother rented a cabin that we could stay at about four hours north of our home. My father couldn't attend due to the fact that he was working, but that was fine with him. We drove up to the cabin, which was literally just a 15 by 15 foot room with an attached bathroom, just enough for a bed, a table, and a small TV and it was cute enough from the outside. There were several cookie cutter cabins you could rent, I think seven in total, that all arced around in a C shape with parking spots in front and at the front of the line of the cabins was where the owner of the cabin stayed in the front desk area, if you will. Anyway, when we first arrived, we were the only people there. No other cabins had been rented out. Even though it was August and this area Although semi-remote, is a tourist destination. It's in northern Michigan. The gentleman that worked at the front desk and owned the cabins came out to greet us. I didn't pay too much attention due to the fact that I was 12 and excited for the fun outdoors adventures that my mother and I were going to have. Climbing the dunes, eating ice cream, swimming, having campfires, all the good stuff. Well. I remember him giving my mom the key and saying the bathroom window is broken and doesn't close all the way, nor does it lock. Which, if we were the only people living there, why not give us a room in which the bathroom did lock? We thought it was kind of strange, but shrugged it off. After a day of adventure, we went out, came back at dusk, and went to bed. 
The next morning, Saturday, we woke up and went to get into the truck, but it wouldn't start. Strange, I will admit, at the time it was a newer SUV. I don't recall what was wrong with it, but I remember the owner of the cabins coming out and being like, Oh, your truck is broke? That's too bad, let me call someone. My mom insisted that she could call somebody, went into his office, used his phone, and called somebody to come and fix it. As we were waiting for someone to get there, the owner came out and said, Did you guys have any problems with the power last night? My mom and I kind of shook our heads, confused. Oh, uh, well, sometimes in that cabin, the power will randomly go out, but all you have to do is come out here and flip the breaker. He then proceeded to show my mother where the breaker was, which happened to be outside of the cabin, behind it, on a pole. After getting the truck fixed and having another day of adventure, we came back ready to settle in for the night. As we were sitting in bed watching TV, the power went out. It didn't flicker, just boom, out. My mom grabbed a flashlight she had packed and we went out there and turned the breaker back on. At this point, we were feeling incredibly uneasy, like anybody would be. We got back in bed and about 10 minutes later, the power went out again. My mom jumped up and ran outside, only to see a man, which I assume was the owner because nobody else was there, running away from the fuse box. We hightailed it out of there so fast. Luckily, everything had been packed because we were leaving the next day, but still, that guy was creepy. When I was in college, I was a banquet worker at a hotel. One night we were hosting a wedding and we ran out of trash bags. We couldn't find any anywhere. So my boss asked me if I could track down a room service cart and grab anything I could find, even if it was small. At this point, it's almost one in the morning. The wedding is winding down and the hotel is quiet. I didn't have access to the room service closets or laundry as a banquet server, so I was literally just going floor to floor, hoping that somebody had left their cart out. Finally, on the sixth floor, I saw a cart at the far end of the hall. I could hear a baby crying, and I saw one of our hotel provided bassinets in the hall next to a closed room door. I had to pass the bassinet to get to the cart. It was empty, as it should have been. As I got closer, the crying became louder. It made absolute sense to me, but it gave me this icky feeling in my stomach. I tried not to think anything about it. The baby must be in the room crying and the parents parked the bassinet outside because they decided not to use it, right? I raided the cart for the roll of bags, and I noticed that the cart belonged to my friend Juana. She had an Aerosmith sticker on her cart, so I knew that it was hers. The next day I saw her at work, and I mentioned that I had stolen her bags and apologized, because she probably had to hunt some down at the very beginning of her shift. I then jokingly thanked her for leaving it next to the bassinet or baby room, and I joked about how unsettling it felt to be in an empty hotel corridor next to an empty bassinet while listening to a crying baby in the wee hours of the morning. She was like, that's weird. I cleaned a room on that floor at the very beginning of my shift. I took the bassinet back down to the rollaway storage room first thing yesterday morning. That family checked out before you even got here. We discussed how unusual it was to have more than one family with a baby request a bassinet so close together, especially on the same floor. We rarely had to dig out a bassinet. At that point, we kind of thought that maybe it was two different families with two different babies who got a bassinet, but it was still strange. As I was leaving and clocking out in the laundry room, Juana stopped me to tell me, 
that the bassinet shouldn't have been there. She double-checked the logs. No other families had requested one, or even been there. We have a checkout sheet for bassinets and rollaway beds, so that if we need one, and we can't find one, we know where they were the last time they were used. Sure enough, Juana's room was the last one to have a bassinet. The sheet showed another coworker checking it out for the family when they arrived, and Juana checking it back into the rollaway room over 12 hours before I saw it in the hallway. I guess technically she could have forged her check-in signature, but why would she have done that? There would have been no point. And she clearly recalled returning it to the closet. Regardless of whether or not that bassinet should have been there, the crying baby definitely shouldn't have, because there was no child, no family, checked into that room or even on that floor. The family had checked out early and had been long gone before I went hunting for a cart. I had an experience with the infamous Franklin Castle in Cleveland, Ohio, back in July of 2009. For those not already familiar with the castle, I strongly recommend looking it up. There are a ton of websites that have articles about the history of it, including the known facts, legends, and personal encounters. In July of 2009, my then boyfriend's brother got a free reservation for a guided group tour of Franklin Castle and invited my then boyfriend and myself to tag along with him and his then girlfriend. I've always been fascinated by the castle, so I was pretty excited. I'm not 100% sure that the tour was legal or that the guide even had permission to enter the castle, but regardless, we went. All of the info the guide gave me matched up with everything I had read about it, so at least he was well informed. The guide started outside at 11 p.m. We were in the yard of Franklin Castle, just staring up at it, and all I could keep thinking about was how long I'd wanted to go in there, and I was finally about to. Once everyone that had reserved a spot for the tour arrived, we started. There were about 20 to 25 of us. The guide took us around the outside of the castle, telling us about it, and then we headed in and went to the first floor, which was the basement, where the servants' area initially was. Within about 15 minutes of being in there, I started to feel kind of funny, like overloaded. I knew what was coming and tried fighting it off, but I couldn't. I started to get dizzy and things started to get dark. I went and sat on the steps, freezing, pale and sweating it out. After about five minutes, I was okay to go on. It was just so intense. Things like this have happened to me before when I'm around immense amounts of energy like that. I think the energy of the house was just too much for my sensitivity. We carried on to the second floor, then the third floor. At this point, I was standing around with a couple of other people, listening to the guide tell us about the floor and any stories surrounding it. All of a sudden, I hear these light footsteps coming from above. I thought it was just my imagination, or maybe somebody went up there ahead of the guide. Then the girl next to me asks the guy next to her, did you hear that? One of them asked the guide if anyone had gone upstairs yet, and the guide confirmed that nobody had ventured to the fourth floor yet. Then we went to the fourth floor and wrapped up the tour. Part of me couldn't wait to get out of there, but another part of me wanted to look around some more. So I followed my boyfriend's brother and his girlfriend down to the third floor, then the second floor, and finally the first floor. I was walking behind my boyfriend's brother's girlfriend through the kitchen area, and she stopped in the doorway in the living area. I was standing behind her, and I suddenly got this overwhelming feeling of uneasiness, to say the least. I got out of there right away. I made my way outside and waited for the others. 
The tour was nice, and the castle was amazing. It was all torn up, though. Between the constant attempts at remodeling, the fire, and its age in general, it was in need of a lot of work and completely unlivable at the time. The guide stated that there were all these plans for it, but most never happened. It's been sold again since then. From what I've read online, the current owners have their own plans, but do not have any interest in doing tours. Only time will tell what's in store next for the castle. First of all, I don't know if this will be scary to you, but it was for me when it happened, and I still get a little frightened when I remember. I can assure you that this story is 100% true. My story starts when I was 15 years old in 2012. Three of my very best friends and I decided to go camping. Luke, who was 17, Louis, who was 16, and Gary, who was 15. Since our dads all worked in the military, we had access to some woods that weren't very far away from our homes, three miles at most. Of course, we weren't trained on anything, but since I lived some time in the middle of the Amazon forest, I had confidence that I could handle a not very far from my house night. It was July, which is winter here in Brazil, and it was really cold, like five degrees Celsius kind of cold, and things were pretty much going as well as you would expect from a camp in the woods. We pretty much sat there and chatted until about one in the morning. Then we decided to take shifts in duos to watch out for any animals that could be near us. We were afraid of jaguars, but probably the most that could get near us would be some capybaras that are pretty common in the region. At around 4 a.m., Gary, my duo, was outside the tent calling for me to stay up with him. But as it was so cold, I wanted to stay inside saying that no animal would go near us with the noise we were making. After like five minutes of back and forth between us, we noticed that we couldn't hear any kind of forest noise. No crickets, owls, twigs breaking from passing animals, nothing. And a feeling of uneasiness began to grow between us. Now I know this whole thing of no forest noise and yada yada sounds a little bit cliche, but I swear that this is real. When something weird is about to happen, everything goes quiet. With this feeling that appeared, we stopped arguing and we started to pay attention for what was happening around us. We didn't want to wake up Luke and Lewis because we thought we were just being silly and nothing would happen. Then from the middle of the woods, we hear a scream. It sounded like a woman screaming, but at the same time, it didn't. The scream sounded human, but something was off. It had a kind of animalistic tone to it. It's really hard to explain. I've searched all over the internet and I can't find any creature that sounded like that. I firmly believe it was not a human screaming. Besides, what would a woman be doing in the woods, alone at night, screaming? With the sound, Luke and Lewis woke up, a little disoriented, while Gary and I jumped out of the tent and grabbed some sticks. That was the only thing we could find that would serve as a weapon. Needless to say, we didn't sleep the rest of the night, and we not so patiently awaited the morning. After what seemed to be hours, but was probably no more than five minutes, the forest resumed its regular noises, and we calmed down a little bit. When the sun rose, we packed our things as fast as we could, and left. When we were getting outside the forest, we told the military that was guarding the woods what we heard but I'm not really sure if they believed some random teenagers. I'm still friends with those guys that camped with me, and every time I see them, I ask them if they remember this, and they all said that they do, and none of us can imagine what could have been screaming that night. We'll never know if we were in any real danger or not. I'm just glad that we got out of it alive. One summer, 
I helped the Boy Scout troop that I was a part of, and we took the troop down to Antietam National Battlefield. I received my Eagle Award two years before, but wasn't particularly active afterwards. I liked camping and they needed a few leaders, so I decided to go. A number of other troops had also come down for the weekend, and we had a weekend full of Civil War education, reenactments, and troops pranking other troops. All of the troops were camped along Antietam Creek, on the other side of the Burnsides Bridge Road. That side isn't part of the park. It was pretty easy for anyone to cross the road and walk onto the battlefield to go up to Burnsides Bridge, along the creek, and see the field where the Union soldiers massed and tried to cross the bridge. I grew up outside of Gettysburg, so ghost stories about Antietam didn't bother me at all. There's enough weird tales in Gettysburg that other battlefields really didn't faze me. The second night that we were there, the troops all hit the hay early due to the fact that they were made to march all day by an overzealous reenactor. I took a walk over to the bridge right after dinner and the sun was slowly sinking towards night. It was actually quite beautiful seeing the field and the creek. I walked up to the bridge and started to cross it when I felt an excruciating sharp pain in my chest. I almost doubled over in pain and clenched my chest. I thought maybe I was having a heart attack, but both of my arms were fine and free to move. I put both hands on the part of my chest that hurt and felt another sharp pain right below the top of my right shoulder, in the meaty part above your pecs, underneath your shoulder and just in front of your underarm. That pain came and knocked me down where I almost cracked my head open on the side of the stone bridge. I laid there, freaking out, and scrambled to my feet and booked it back to camp. I got back to camp and had the other scoutmaster take a look at my chest. I have these two raised red lumps that, under the skin, you could see were turning into blood blisters. He asked me what I was doing, and I told him that it happened when I was just walking around the battlefield. Not once had I thought about a haunting or anything like that. I called in an evening and turned in. The next morning, after breakfast, the troops were scheduled to meet with a park official at Burnside's Bridge. Our troop and about four other ones stood on the battlefield facing toward the bridge where the park official was detailing the history of the battle. When he talked about the bridge, then I paid more attention. I found out that Confederate sharpshooters took up positions on the other side of the creek and that on the side where we were all at was the Union. The Union soldiers were supposed to take the bridge and were just picked off left and right up on that bridge. Confederates lost somewhere in the neighborhood of 500 soldiers and the Union lost over 15,000. No Union soldier ever made it past the halfway point of the bridge. At this point, my scoutmaster just looks at me, and I'm wondering what the hell happened to me the night before. I'm pretty sure that I felt ghost bullets, and to this day, it's one of the weirdest things I've ever had happen to me. My wife and I bought our house almost three years ago. The very first night while we were there, we were laying in bed about to fall asleep when we heard a loud knock on the kitchen floor. It was like something very heavy had fallen. We jumped out of bed to find nothing. We hadn't even unpacked anything. Over the next few weeks, we would hear the doors in our basement open and shut. Several times I would get up and go down to the basement to see if anything was out of the ordinary, but nothing would ever be out of place. We have a completely finished basement and it's not creepy or anything like that. Over time, activity would mellow out and then ramp back up again. My wife and I would both, on occasion, 
catch somebody standing in the kitchen as we walked by the kitchen door. But when we did a double take, nobody would be there. Most of the activities that we experience take place during the day. So I don't think it's just us being spooked by the dark or something. My children have had many strange occurrences too. I was in the kitchen one day and my son was sitting on the stairs to the basement. He jumped up and ran to me saying, the bad man's in the basement. I asked, where? And he replied, at the bottom of the stairs. Being a rational adult and not wanting our three-year-old to be afraid, I decided to walk him down and show him that there was nothing to be afraid of. We found no one. A couple of weeks later while I was at work, my wife and kids were home alone. My wife was in the bedroom and my son in the living room playing trains. All of a sudden, my kid screams and runs into my wife shouting, the bad daddy is in the kitchen. My wife looked, but nobody was there. Sometime later, my wife and kids and I were in the living room watching TV while the kids played. Both my son and daughter stop at the exact same time look at the kitchen and follow something there with their eyes down the hall into a bedroom, back down the hall and through the kitchen. We were sitting there watching both of them track the same thing that we couldn't see. Another time, the four of us were in the kitchen planting seeds for our garden in the little seed starter trays when our daughter stops and looked at the doorway to the basement. She smiled and said, are you playing in the basement? She was two at the time and spoke clear as day to somebody that we could not see. Other times we would hear our kids talk to somebody when they were in their rooms completely alone. One Sunday morning while watching football, I was sitting on the couch with my back to the bedroom door, which was open. I decided to get up and make some breakfast. The door was open when I walked into the kitchen. When I came back, the door was closed. I thought it was odd, but I just sat back down and continued to watch the game. After a while, I got back up to go to the bathroom, and I noticed that the door was opened halfway. When I returned to the living room, it was shut again. The rest of the day, I sat in the chair adjacent to the couch so that I could have a full view of the door. We've had many strange encounters. These are just the few that I can think of off the top of my head. The activity seems to be picking up again, and my wife wants to sage again. I try to be rational and remind her that this is a 70-year-old house. There will be noises. But as a skeptic, I find it hard to be skeptical with the amount of activity we have here. My husband and I met a guy who used to work in our house. In conversation one day, he said, so have you met the ghosts yet? My husband started laughing and said, we sure have. We were a little bit skeptical as to whether we'd imagined the things that happened, but laborers working here have been very unsettled by some events, and in some cases they've refused to come back. We've always lived in houses where strange things happen but this one has really been a wild ride. It's very haunted. Noises, floorboards creaking with footsteps, bangs, doors opening, lights and sockets switching on and off, things moving, voices, shadows, it's crazy. He also told us some of the things that happened here. It's a very old house, and in recent years it was a home for addicts with new babies. A lot of serious, horrific trauma happened here, I cried when he told us about it. It's unsurprising to me, therefore, that the energy here is so charged. Knowing this, I thought that over the weekend I might light some candles and sage the house, and invite anything to leave that needs to go, though I suppose some will probably want to stay. I'd be interested to know what you would do here. Our family and friends have said to move out, but we like it here. We don't have any bad experiences, really. We're not frightened. And 
As far as advice goes, I don't really want any advice on exorcisms or fleeing the house. The worst thing we've ever experienced was a disembodied groaning noise. It was very human and very strange, but if it was intended to frighten us, it didn't. I raised my eyebrows at my husband and then carried on working. Last night, my husband and I opened doors and windows all throughout the house. We started in the cellar and worked our way up through the house. There are 28 rooms or spaces, so it took us ages. I used white sage sticks, tea light candles, and a bowl each to carry the candles in, which were gifts from loved ones and sentimental to us. As we moved through the house, I just talked, asking any spirits who didn't respect us or wanted to harm us to leave our house, that this was our home and we wouldn't tolerate it, and that if anybody wished to stay, they could, but they had to respect us and treat us with kindness and we would do the same. In the rooms where we felt the most oppressive energy, one bedroom in particular, I spent a while talking out loud to any spirits trapped here because of the traumatic house history. I said that they were free to move on now and to go and find their loved ones. Who knows if it did anything, but I felt like we had to try. So I did it with belief and conviction. My husband had a strange interaction in the cellar where the sage was knocked from his hand, but he remained firm and told them that they had to leave and they weren't allowed to touch him. Our cat was avidly watching the house spirit cat as usual and following it around. And then he seemed to be watching and following things with his eyes through the kitchen to the back door. We were just watching, fascinated. I said thank you just in case they were leaving. So we'll see if things get better. We'll see if they seem more peaceful. I certainly slept very well last night, so fingers crossed. When I was 15 or so, a group of my friends and I all slept over at the leader of our friend group's house. This guy lived in the most absolutely rural area of our rural town, basically in the middle of the woods, a house just surrounded by thick walls of trees. In the evening, we decided to go out and start a bonfire deep in the woods. So we packed up, got all of our materials and went straight out there. On the way to the spot that we'd be making our campfire at, he told us about how messed up and creepy his woods are and the numerous things he's seen. White skinny figures peeking around the shed, staring at him and running off when he looked at it, screaming and whispers from the woods, figures watching him, all that good stuff. It set the mood pretty well. By around seven o'clock that night, we had the campfire set up and it was pitch black outside as it was the middle of winter in New Hampshire. I can still remember how creepy the whole vibe was that night. You couldn't see a single thing besides the ring of light coming from the fire. Everything else was just a black wall of nothingness and the sound of the forest was so quiet that the silence was almost deafening. At least it was if we weren't talking. We ended up needing more firewood and a few other things that we were using for the campfire, so the leader took me to go with him to get it. Without a flashlight or any light source, he and I walked the mile and a half long trail back to his house in complete and utter darkness. It was all good. We were talking, joking with each other, having a good time and just hanging out when the first noises started. He immediately made me stop talking. To my left and my right were a bunch of different sounds, screaming, laughing, talking and whispering, shouting, people saying unintelligible words. It sounded like there was something around 20 people just surrounding us. The natural night vision had finally set in a decent amount and I looked over at my friend who had his head down, 
and didn't say a single word. Known for being a complete goofball and a wild, funny dude, I had never seen him look so shaken and serious in my life. He had this look to him that still kind of haunts me to this day, as I knew him pretty well, and he always portrayed himself as the fearless leader type. Seeing him so shaken up and afraid was very unsettling. I started to say something along the lines of, what the heck is that? Before he cut me off and told me to be quiet, face forward, and not to pay attention to any of the sounds. I did what he said, and the next three minutes or so were incredibly uncomfortable and terrifying. I remember feeling sick to my stomach. By the time we reached his house, the sounds had stopped. We both grabbed what we needed in total silence. That's when I could really listen to the sheer quietness of that night. No birds, no sticks falling, not a single sound absurdly silent. We walked back to the campsite and nothing else occurred that night. It's still my most unsettling and bizarre experience that I have no explanation for and I'll never forget it. About 20 years ago, my best friend at the time and his wife had her father, Felix, living with them. They were his caretakers. They pretty much did everything for him, and that included cleaning him every morning because of his incontinence and difficulty holding his bowels. They really did a great job and deserved my compliment several times. One day, my friend Mike went into Felix's room when he would normally be awakening only to find him in full rigor mortis. Felix had sadly passed some time in the night. I was employed at the time as a cemetery pre-need salesman, but also could arrange at-need services, and so I did. I helped them to prepare Felix's final resting location and waived my commission as it just didn't feel right charging it. These two individuals had done so much to make his last years comfortable I just couldn't take that money. About a week later, we held the service, which I officiated. It was well attended and we gave Felix the send off he deserved. I rode home in the limo provided for the family by the funeral home and cemetery after the service. And we all sat around for a while, just decompressing and taking a well needed break. The wife, Mary, then noticed that there was a message on their answering machine. This was during the time where we had physical landlines and attached answering machines. She pressed the play button and the timestamp that the machine read was the identical time as when we had started the graveside service. It was recorded at 11 a.m. sharp. We thought at first it was just somebody who had missed the service calling to wish condolences. When the recording started, though, every jaw in the room dropped, and an oddness to goodness chill filled the room. There were five of us present. Mike, Mary, the daughter, myself, my brother James, and a friend of theirs from across the street whose name I don't know. The background noise was the first thing we heard. It sounded like somebody was in a room with a large group of people. You know, lots of audible voices, but nothing we could discern. Then, Felix spoke. The voice on the recording was clearly and unmistakably Felix. He said, Please, do not follow me. Then the recording stopped. We had what seemed like a recently deceased parent calling us during his own funeral service, begging us to please not follow him. The rest of the group talked about what he could have meant. Don't follow him to death? Not possible, they said. Don't follow his life choices? He had made many bad ones during his life. The daughter absolutely believes that he was saying, don't follow me into hell. She believed until her dying day 
that her father had made contact one last time, telling her to not follow his path and end up where he did once he took that step into the unknown. I always thought that was so strange. 20 years later, and I remember that moment and the stunned silence, shock, and fear, just like it happened yesterday. Nobody was comforted. It honestly felt chilling. I still don't know what he meant, but I am 100% certain that the phone call was definitely from Felix, and it definitely came from the other side. I wanted to share an experience that still freaks me out just thinking about it. Just down the road from where I used to live a few years ago in southeast Australia is the opening into about a hundred acres of woodland and bush. I frequently went in there when I was younger to do the usual things, riding and camping, etc. I was out driving at about 11.30 p.m. with my girlfriend, and as we were in the area, I decided to show her the woodlands while we were there. She loves everything to do with nature, and it was summer, so it was extremely warm. I left my car with the lights shining into the trees as we weren't going in too far, and it was pitch black inside. The two of us just sat, having a smoke, chatting, and generally relaxing. She was sitting on a sort of map of the area that had been put in some plastic and I was keeping an eye on the trees as I had a feeling that something was just wrong. I've read stories before about people who felt like they were in danger, even though nothing around them was perceptibly off, and this was that same feeling. Every sense was almost reaching out, and my adrenaline was up, but there wasn't really anything in my eyeline that seemed any different. After lighting another cigarette to calm my nerves, I scanned the tree line again and realized that it looked different from before. It was only after staring into the darkness that I saw that there was moonlight, which was now lighting up grass. Before, it couldn't reach the grass, and it dawned on me that that was because there was a black shape blocking it. I assumed it was a tree. The only way that I can describe it was that all sound just ceased and everything went dead silent. A few seconds later, this disgusting feeling of dread fell over me, and I saw motion in the dark of the path as this thing crawled toward us on all fours. I've seen nearly every animal in the outback here, and we don't have any large predators like in the United States or Europe, but somehow I knew this thing was a predator, and it wasn't hiding itself from us just slowly crawling toward us. I don't know if my girlfriend saw it or not, as I couldn't look away, but just as it reached the line that my car lights were able to illuminate, it reared up onto two legs and just sat, staring at us. I'm 6'4", and this thing was about another meter taller than me, with arms that were far too long, that reached down near the ground. All I could make out was an off-white, almost yellowish fur on it, and in the dim light, could make out the silhouette of its head as being that of a dog or a wolf. I wasn't able to move as it stared at me, but it was at this point that my girlfriend gasped, which seemed to break me out of whatever was stopping me from thinking logically. I grabbed her by the arm and we sprinted to the car, slammed the doors and tore out of there as fast as I could. Both of us were too scared to speak until about a half an hour later. We've both discussed it many times, and the feeling that we had was what I imagine a rabbit sees when it catches a wolf or a fox looking at it, that this is something that would be able to end us with absolute ease if it chose to. Neither of us have ever been able to come up with any explanation for what it was, but it has definitely changed the way I view the woods and bush when I go camping or hiking now. Every time I go out, I think back to that day, and I wonder what it was, and if I'll ever see it again. I 
I've never thought about glitches in the Matrix as a serious thing, until I started reading more about them. All this time, I've blamed my weird experiences on ghosts. Though I've never seen one, I still believe in them, since my experiences are, at least to me, still unexplainable. I moved into my current house six years ago. It's almost a hundred years old, in the oldest neighborhood in my very large city. Weird things would happen, but we would just shrug it off. You know, lights flickering when we would tease each other about ghosts, things falling off the shelves and out of the cabinets, things going missing and then reappearing in weird places, or by weird means. And then, these three events happened. 1. Our living room TV remote disappeared for two years. Then, one afternoon, I was sitting on the couch, picking up little play balls and throwing them to my toddler. I went to pick up another ball, and right in the middle of the ball pile was the remote. It wasn't there when I made the ball pile. I still thought that maybe somehow the toddler had put it there, but I really don't think so. Number two. I used our garden hose, which has a very specific cap on it. I was done with the hose, wound it back up, turned it on to wash my hands off, turned it off, capped it, and walked away. As I was walking away, my roommate walked to the hose and immediately asked where the cap was. I turned, walked the several feet back to the hose, and sure enough, that cap was gone. Not on the ground, not in the bushes, nowhere. I still just thought that maybe somehow it got lost, but that doesn't make a bit of sense. I had just put that cap back on a few seconds before, and nobody else had walked up in that amount of time. Last, but definitely not least, the weirdest incident that actually made me believe it was a ghost was this. I was sitting on one side of the couch, and my roommate was on the other side. He started the movie that we were going to watch. I had an ashtray and a lighter sitting next to me. I put everything down right where it was supposed to go, and then leaned the lighter onto the ashtray. A few minutes later, I went to get it again, but the lighter was gone. I figured maybe it slipped between the couch cushions or went somewhere else, but nope. We took all the cushions off, and it wasn't there. My roommate picked the entire couch up, and nothing was underneath it. The lighter just vanished. I ended up having to use a book of matches. After the movie, I went to bed, but I left everything else, minus the lighter, on the couch. I woke up the next morning, but where I had left my matches was my lighter, laying right in its spot. At first I was like, let's be reasonable here, and called my roommate. He said that he didn't find or see the lighter, but he remembers the matches because he used one in the morning before he left for work and put them right next to the ashtray. Ever since then I was convinced that there was a ghost in my house, but maybe these are glitches in the matrix. What do you think? The most commonly known ghostly figure of Southeast Asia is the Pontiana. A Pontiana is basically a woman who has died during childbirth and haunts pregnant women to rip the child out of the womb. Another favorite prey is men. The Pontiana is able to disguise herself as a beautiful woman and will use this disguise to lure men to their deaths by digging into their stomachs with its sharp nails. I don't have any stories on those, but allow me to share a story that my cousins encountered in the mid-1990s. Malaysia is multicultural, so it's not unusual to see whole neighborhoods with a colorful array of different cultures and religious beliefs. During a particular month of every year, Taoists burn hell money for their departed loved ones, in line with their practice of ancestor worship. 
The belief is simply that loved ones linger, even after death. And by sending large amounts of hell money to be used in the afterlife, the departed can affect your fortunes. As such, getting in the way of burnt hell money is extremely taboo, even for non-believers. It's akin to taking the Bible out and peeing all over it. It may not mean anything to you, but it's highly disrespectful. People tend to adhere not just out of common decency, but also out of a strong belief that you will be haunted and your fortunes will suffer if you interfere. Burning hell money may be your religious right, but there's also etiquette to follow. Responsible worshipers usually burn the money in burners, but sometimes people want to save a few bucks, so they'll burn the money right in the middle of the sidewalk. I have lost count of the number of times that I've had to take a detour because somebody decided to use up the entire sidewalk for this event. My cousins at the time were Muslim and very young. They were not aware of the customs and cultures of their neighbors who were Taoists. It was at that time of the year again where people were burning hell money. My aunt let her kids outside to play and shortly after was horrified to find her two daughters kicking and playing amongst a pile of burnt hell money. Things went downhill from there. My aunt started feeling that the air in the house was just not quite right, and she would often find my cousins just sitting in the room, in the darkness, staring at the ceiling. When asked what they were looking at, the eldest cousin would simply reply, somebody's floating up there. It gradually got worse. One night, she was awoken to find the eldest girl screaming and yelling at something to keep away from her sister, but nothing was there, at least nothing that anyone else could see. Later on, the skin on their legs darkened as if it was bruised. They kept telling my aunt that their legs hurt all the time. It wasn't until my aunt visited a local medium the encounter stopped. I wasn't there, so I can't vouch for anything, but my aunt is the sweetest lady I've ever known. And she's never lied to me before, at least not on that level. So I believe something happened. All this talk of hell money and the like might sound a little outrageous, but being born in Singapore, stories like these used to scare me as I was exposed to these customs and practices on a daily basis. Even now, as a full-on atheist, I'm still very wary of stepping, even accidentally, on any offering that's meant for the dead. So, call me crazy, and I'm sure some people will, that's okay. But I swear this happened to me when I was 16. What's weirder is that it happened on the same night that I had an alien abduction dream. My mom wasn't home. She worked nights looking after the elderly at a nearby retirement home. I lived a normal teenage night playing video games, messaging friends, and watching TV. I went to my room and went to sleep. I had an extremely intense nightmare that I was abducted by aliens. All I remembered is looking up in my dream and seeing my whole field of vision turn completely white as I simultaneously heard this really loud buzzing or humming sound. I wake up drenched in sweat, heart pounding, and it's around 5.30 in the morning. But what's weirder is that I'm not in my bed. Confused as heck, I look around the room and to my surprise, I'm somehow in my mom's room, frozen in fear and confused. I tried to figure out what was going on. After about 20 to 30 minutes, I finally calmed myself down enough to get up. So I get up and when I go downstairs, I can see through the door to our backyard, which is made of glass and I can clearly see that the gate to our backyard is wide open. It's an old fashioned wooden gate and it hadn't been opened in years because it was covered in vines and was always left locked. 
I go to investigate, and as I go to unlock the back door, the door handle goes down with no resistance at all. And I realize, crap, this door is already unlocked, which only added to how shook up I was, to be honest. So hesitantly, I go into the backyard anyway, and I look at the gate, which is also open. I look for footprints or boot marks, thinking that somebody must have kicked the gate open. Nothing. I look more closely. The old rusty lock to the gate, which hasn't been opened in years, is still there. Not bent. Not damaged. Not broken at all. Just a bit rusty. The same as it's always been. I lock that gate back up and look around the yard. Nothing's missing. I go back in the house. I lock the back door and take a real good look around. And nothing's missing. I go back to my bedroom and double check that I did get in my bed that night. And yep, I definitely did. The bed's still messy. I thought, did I sleepwalk? Did I go into the yard and then somehow go get in my mom's bed? I checked the carpet and floors in the house, which certainly would have been dirty and muddy if I had walked into the yard and then back in. And nothing. I called my mom and explained everything that had happened and I asked if she had messed with the gate or unlocked it lately. She confirmed that she hadn't, and was just as surprised and confused as I was. To this day, I have no explanation as to what happened that night. Just to confirm, I was very into sports as a teenager. I didn't smoke, I didn't drink, I didn't take substances, and I was completely sober. I also remember feeling oddly terrified of the sky as it began to get dark out that evening. I remember sometimes that if I was playing football or soccer with friends after that and it started getting dark, instead of walking home like I usually would, I'd kind of hustle. I'd constantly look up at the sky, feeling fear. And I remember a number of times where I decided to just run home instead because I was scared, even months later. All of this still confuses me, even to this day. Back when I was in my late teens, I moved out of the house and out of town, and I rented a room from some couple. The woman didn't work, but her partner did, so she had lots of time on her hands, and she tried to control everything in the house, including me. I was working two jobs while studying. The woman, who literally had no life besides trying to mess up other people's lives, started doing a lot of weird things. I would wake up and find her watching me sleep. She stole my sunglasses, killed my fish, etc. She tried bossing me around and trolling me in real life. However, she would disappear every full moon to apparently get nude and dance with her coven in the mountains. She claimed to be a witch despite my interest in spirituality and tarot I actually don't believe in witches or witchcraft, but nonetheless she claimed to be one. I think the spells work on a belief system that causes a domino effect of either positive or negative things occurring. Either way, no matter. I decided I had had enough of tolerating her BS and I moved out. That resulted in her stalking me. She turned up twice to my workplaces, staring at me for hours. I reported her to the police. Then she tried to cyberstalk me via Facebook and phoning me a million times. After moving into a new place, I would wake up in the night to see something standing in the corner of my room. Yet whenever I got up or turned the light on, it disappeared. Hence, I assumed I was dreaming. Eventually, it started standing at the foot of my bed. But again, whenever I tried to get up or turn the light on, it would vanish. One night, I woke up to it standing there like usual, but I could see a creepy woman's face on it. It was smiling at me. I told it to F off, and it vanished. For a while, I didn't see the thing, but I started coming up with scratches all over my body. I had no idea where they were coming from. I would find them on my arms, my chest, my hips, my thighs. 
One night I woke up and ran to the bathroom mirror because I thought something had bit me. Instead, I found scratches on my shoulder and back, like somebody had just clawed me. I checked my bed for anything that could scratch me, and I even visited a doctor who just accused me of self-harm. I wasn't, and I couldn't figure out where these scratches were coming from. The last incident occurred one night when I was half asleep and rolled over onto my side. I felt air on my face. I originally ignored it, until I felt a big gust of air directly into my face. I opened my eyes to come face to face with this rotten, bloated, dead-looking woman. She looked wet, like someone had killed her and then left her in water to rot. Her body was coming out from underneath the bed while her head was propped up near my face. I actually screamed and I was too scared to get off the bed. So, like a little kid, I covered my face with a blanket and I started saying prayers and waited until morning. After that, it never came back and all the scratches healed. It scares me to think about, but I do wonder if it lived under my bed for a period of time and was somehow scratching me from underneath. As to where it came from, again, I don't believe in spells and whatever, but whatever it was wanted to pose as a female, and I think it was part of my loser ex-housemate's nonsense, like a malevolent manifestation of spite or something she had sent after me. I don't really know what it was, but I haven't seen it in a long time, so... As long as it stays that way, I guess it's all good. Redditor Arctic Fox of the North came to the Ghost Story subreddit to tell not one, but three ghostly tales. Let's hear what happened. So I've wanted somewhere to share my experiences, and figured here was as good as any. My encounters with ghosts have all been pretty short, so far, so I thought I'd just put them all into one story. To this day, I'm convinced that my workplace is haunted. I had my first encounter while at work one evening. It was a little late, and a co-worker and I were staying behind to clean up after the others had left for the day, which is something we regularly do. I was going about my business and cleaning up, but when we were done and heading back to the sluice, my co-worker and best friend noticed that I had a pretty large oil stain in the shape of a handprint on my upper back. At first I was suspicious of my co-worker, thinking that she had placed her hand on my back, but we later compared her hand to the one that was on my clothing and her hand was way too small. Thinking back on it, I had never felt anybody put their hand on my back while I was working. That and the stain was so visible that if somebody had actually put their hand on my back, they would have needed to keep it there for a while and while I was moving around. I find this pretty freaky. I still have no clue where it came from or how it got there. My second and most recent encounter happened two days ago. The weather was pretty bad and the power ended up going out, halting production. The foreman and assistant foreman told us to go wait in the sluice, but it got a bit crowded, so we eventually shuffled into the cafeteria. My best friend and I were made to go clean up like usual, but since it was almost pitch black, we couldn't see anything, and thus we only finished off with all the machines the best we could. When we got back into the sluice, we both saw somebody standing by the racks where we would usually hang our work clothes. But when we got around the corner and out from behind one of the shoe racks, there was nobody there. We looked into the foreman's office that's attached to the stairwell and looked into the other sluice, which is right beside the one we use, but no one was there. The weirdest part is that we both saw two different ghosts. I saw a short and stubby figure, while my best friend saw a tall and lanky one. By far the weirdest experience that I've ever had. But the other one happened a while ago. 
I was visiting my best friend, and we were watching The Conjuring, as you do. She had turned on some candles for some ambiance. Well, while we were watching the movie, one of the candles she lit almost went out, while the other one was standing perfectly still. What I find scary is that the candle only moved whenever something happened on screen. This candle was on a shelf, mind you. I got so creeped out that I eventually just blew out the candle. Something I should note is that my best friend has an attachment, her words, not mine, and now I'm pretty sure something has latched onto me as well. Her house has this old sword that she says has the souls of all of its victims trapped inside, even the original owner of the sword. She's experienced way more spooky things than I have, so I suppose she has more authority on this particular subject. Nevertheless, it's kind of scary, even though she always assures me that the ghosts at her home aren't harmful, but they do like to mess around. Somehow, that's less than comforting. This isn't my story, but it is my parents and two incredibly close family friends who told it. Before I was born, the four of them used to hang out a lot. They would often drive far out into the Mojave Desert, just to party and to drink around a fire and have a good time. For this story, I'm going to call my dad Conrad and my mom Stacy. Their friends, I'll call Brad and Gina. So they drive all the way out into the desert and have a fire. It's summertime and it's hot. Although it's the middle of the night, it's still warm. My mom, Stacy, and her friend Gina were starting to get scared about tarantulas and decided that they didn't want to camp out there after all. So all four of them started driving back. It was like two o'clock in the morning and they were on a dirt road that went for miles and miles with nothing on it. Suddenly, up ahead in the headlights, they saw the silhouette of a man in a long black trench coat with a wide brimmed hat. The collar of his coat was pulled up. He was walking alongside the road, going the same direction that they were driving. My dad grew up hitchhiking a lot, and he used to pick up hitchhikers as well. So my mom knew that my dad would consider stopping and talking to this guy to see if he needed a ride. But they got this terrible feeling about him. My mom always said that just in the way he was walking, the way he looked and how he was dressed, and how he was just out there in the middle of nowhere with nothing, he just emitted this really messed up energy that felt absolutely terrifying and even evil. Gina felt the same way. My dad starts joking, hey, let's pick this guy up. And my mom and Gina immediately start screaming and crying and begging him not to. They were in the back seat. My dad was driving and Brad was in the passenger seat. Gina was even kind of punching my dad in the back, screaming, no, don't stop, don't stop. I guess my dad slowed way down as he passed him though. And they all turned to look at him as they went by. But the moment that they passed him, he was gone. He disappeared into thin air. It's not like there were rocks or trees or anything to hide behind. The weird thing is, I grew up hearing this story from my parents, but living far away from their friends. When I was very young, we moved up north and they lost touch. Although whenever we would come back to California to visit, we'd always get together with them and it was like nothing had changed. I moved back to California as an adult and I work for Gina now. One of our first conversations when I came back was about the hat man. She brought it up, not me. 
And word for word almost, it was the exact same story that my parents had always told me growing up. To be honest, I've always secretly feared, yet been very intrigued by this entity because of their story. And then so many more stories that I have now read online. I couldn't believe it was such a big phenomenon when I first found it on the internet. Because I was growing up just hearing my parents' story, long before the internet even existed. To this day, he fascinates and terrifies me. When I was young, I attended the local scout group based in my village in Hampshire. The amount of things that I learned from scouts and the lessons that it taught me are innumerable, but one particular memory stands out. Once on a camp at an old scouting campsite, I remember we were playing a game at night, which was World War II themed. Our leader loved creating military themed games. In this game, each team had a bomb a colored string of wool, that they had to fix to the enemy base, which was a random piece of rope that was put up in the woods, making sure not to get caught by the enemy soldiers, which were the leaders carrying flashlights. As somewhat of a tactician, I departed from the other scouts, who were heading straight down the main path toward the enemy base, and also toward the leaders, instead opting to flank around deep into the woods which took longer, but proved to be more successful in the dark. Eventually, deep in the woods and on my way to another bombing run, I heard the distant sound of the whistle. This signaled that the game was over and that everyone should return to the camp. I began making a leisurely stroll back through the darkness. I can't remember if I was alerted by sight or by sound, but my attention was drawn to a short silhouette walking through the woods about six to eight meters away. Assuming that this was one of the younger scouts who was also returning to camp, I decided that it would be funny to try and scare them by making growling noises. Immediately after making the noises, the silhouette stopped dead in its tracks, turning toward me. In the darkness, I couldn't make out any of their clothes or features, but I could clearly see the blacked out silhouette of a child. After the figure had clearly noticed me, but not made a sound, I decided to carry on making growling noises. But then the silhouette just turned around and began to walk away from me. They were clearly unfazed by my attempt to scare them. So I figured that I would just follow them back to camp. However, after a few steps, the figure literally face planted into the ground, still about eight meters in front. I jogged a bit to catch up with them and make sure they were okay, but upon reaching where they were, there was no trace of anyone. Confused, I looked around for a short while, seeing if they had scrambled off, but there was no noise of someone running away, and I didn't notice them get up. They had just vanished. Still in a state of confusion, I continued to walk back to the camp alone. I didn't really tell anyone until years later when it clicked in my brain that things just didn't add up. Something else that sticks in my memory from that camp, which is probably unrelated but still strange, was that part of the woods had been cut down and the grounds heavily churned up by some sort of heavy-duty machine. Whilst exploring this area, some of my friends and I found an old leather briefcase that looked like it had been churned up by whatever machine had been in the area. Upon opening the briefcase, we found a really old scouting uniform, think sand colored and military style with shoulder lapels, with quite a few loose badges and some other personal items that I can't remember. I don't know if it was related to the boy or not, but it's still kind of strange. A little background. I am from Glenmore, Banyawangi, Indonesia. 
I work at a busy chemicals and perfumes factory for laundry. The place is on a narrow street between large farm fields and oil refineries. Since my home is a long way, I sleep in the factory bunks. This is where I encountered a lot of paranormal things. First, I remember it was a sunny and very hot afternoon. There was nobody in the factory because it was a holiday. I was the only one there because I had to check machinery routinely to make sure everything was in order. Suddenly, I heard a very loud bang, like somebody had punched the tables in front of me. And when I looked, there was a white smoke emerging from it, almost like a vape smoke, but much thicker and denser. It disappeared after that. It wasn't from chemicals or any of the other things going on in the factory. It was very strange. It almost looked like the smoke was aware of my presence. Second, one time I was trying to sleep and I couldn't close my eyes, even though I felt very sleepy. I just couldn't close them. It was like I was waiting for something to show up and eventually something started to. I can only sleep like 2 to 3 p.m. And all the while, almost every time, there's this shadow-like figure. It flies through the machines or it will crawl beside the bed. I feel afraid, but there's nothing I can do about it. My body freezes still every time that I try to stand to watch it. It's a terrifying experience and it happened every single time that I would try to sleep there. Third, this happened like a month ago. It was raining on a Sunday night. I was still inside the factory, waiting until the rain stopped. I walked into the kitchen to make myself some coffee, and that's when I heard a whispering voice inside the women's bathroom. I know that it's only me in there, and everyone else has gone home but it's very clearly a voice, just humming. It was raspy though. It almost sounded like a woman in pain, humming to soothe herself. The next second, it was whispering some kind of words that I couldn't understand. My body got really cold and I started to shake. I wanted to run, but I couldn't. It was like something was holding my feet tightly. The whisper became louder. My eyes actually started tearing up. I kept thinking, I can't handle this. I just want to cry. But I couldn't even do that. Finally, after 20 or 30 seconds of this, I broke the hold and got out of there. I didn't care if it was raining. It was better than being in there. A lot of other things have happened at that factory, but those three were the scariest. I want to quit, but it has a decent salary, and so ultimately I stayed, and I still do. I still work there, and I still have to spend the night there sometimes too. Things keep happening, but so far, nothing as scary as all of those things. But I'm sure it's only a matter of time. In September, my partner and I signed the lease on a dream apartment. I was ridiculously excited, and I kept telling everybody I knew all about it, to the point where I was probably pretty annoying. One day, a friend of mine came to visit me at work, and of course, I told her the news of our new place. She asked me where it was, and when I told her the location, she turned pale and seemed uncomfortable at best and flat out scared at worst. She asked to see a picture of the inside and when I showed her, she let out a long sigh of relief, then proceeded to tell me one of the creepiest stories I have ever heard. It turns out that about five years ago, 
She had lived in the house directly next to mine with her sister and boyfriend. Starting almost immediately when they moved in, they began hearing noises out in the kitchen area at night when they were sleeping. And occasionally, they woke up to the cabinets or kitchen tools being opened or scattered around. Eventually, they started to hear what sounded like kids talking in low voices in the kitchen at night, occasional crying, and crashes that sounded far off but still somewhere in the house. Around this time, my friend and her sister started to fight a lot, and she said that they'd both been feeling extremely irritable about everything. Their house was broken into while they were all at work one night, but nothing was stolen except for some cheap costume jewelry. There was cash, valuable jewelry, and designer clothing in the house, but all of it was left untouched. Later in the same month, they received a visit from the cops, who said a neighbor had called about screaming and crying coming from the house and had reported that they had left their children alone when they went out. They didn't have kids. The cops were called a few other times and finally got a search warrant. Somehow, they ended up finding a trap door under the kitchen window area that was covered in a layer of leaves and dirt. They found out that it was the remains of a very old root cellar. I live in one of the oldest cities in America, and much of the structures are built on top of older structures. That's not the surprising part. One thing led to another in the search down there, and the police recovered some very old skeletal remains of two children. Nobody seemed to know if the skeletons or the root cellar were there first. During all of this, my friend and her sister broke their lease and moved out of there immediately, as they were terrified to be there any longer. I went through with my lease, and I live in the building next door to where all this happened. My apartment is an old adobe market that was converted into an apartment in the 70s, and it's been an absolute dream to live here. No scary vibes or noises at all. The couple who live in that house now seem pretty nice and keep to themselves. We all have high adobe privacy walls and coyote fences, and I feel tempted to see if they know about all of this. But I'm afraid it might make them uncomfortable if I approach them about it. In any case, that was the wildest story I've ever heard. This happened back in 2019, around November 2nd, if I remember correctly. This story is 100% true although I'm still unsure if it was just a coincidence or what. But anyway, this is what happened. Back in 2019, I was pretty much depressed the whole year. I wasn't planning on doing anything, I just didn't care as much about my well-being. I stopped wearing a seatbelt. I didn't care if I lived or died. It wasn't that I wanted to do either, I just was apathetic. Due to this depression and things getting worse for me mentally at the time, I did a lot of really dumb things in the supernatural realm. I've always known not to speak to the dead, knowing that when you speak to one spirit, the rest can hear you as well. I've always been extremely superstitious, and I believe in the paranormal and supernatural a thousand percent. Anyway, I live next to a huge cemetery and I drive by it every day since it's right across from my neighborhood. Due to my superstitions and believing that the dead can do things us humans aren't quite capable of, each day I would scream out of the window when passing the cemetery, begging one of the spirits to, shall we say, bring me to their side. This habit started on November 2nd, I believe. So I did that each day while driving past the cemetery. Lo and behold, on November 6, I was driving to work at about 4.30 in the morning. I go the same way every single day. I was coming up on a red light. Out of nowhere, and I kid you not, this was literally out of nowhere. 
I hear this loud honk from behind me, and I was rear-ended by one of those big white RG&E trucks. You know the ones that fix telephone poles and stuff? Since I was at the red light, it basically pushed my car forward into the middle of the intersection. And once again out of nowhere, I was T-boned by some random man in a van with his wife. I was driving an 05 Nissan Sentra at the time, and it was completely wrecked. Literally demolished. But I had not one scratch on me at all. My knees were extremely bruised. I have no idea how that happened, but that was pretty much it. This also happened literally on the main road coming out of my neighborhood, about a mile down from the cemetery. And there are never cars this early in the morning. Maybe one, but even that's rare for the most part. While I was talking to the old man, they live in a town 40 minutes away, and they were driving to the park at 4.30 in the morning? The whole story is so weird, and it honestly kind of creeps me out, especially because one of the things I kept yelling was to get me in a car accident. It was an extremely bad financial situation for me at the time, and I was stuck without a car for quite some time. I think perhaps the cemetery or the spirits within it were maybe giving me what I asked for, but not what I asked for. Maybe they just wanted to wake me up and help me appreciate life again. Or maybe it was just a completely weird coincidence. Take it for what you will, but it was an extremely weird thing. I know this story is going to sound weird and crazy, but hear me out. I'm not too familiar with this subreddit, but a friend of mine who's always talking about metaphysics, the twilight zone, simulation type stuff, loves this sub and keeps telling me to post my story. Anyway, here's my story. Two weeks ago, I was about to get ready for a party at six. Just before I started getting ready, one of my friends messaged me super excited because a guy she's had a crush on for the last four years finally asked her out and he was coming to the party with her. While I was texting her back, my younger brother walked into the room and asked if I could drive him to his friend's house, which I agreed to do. Then I went into the bathroom to have a shower and do my makeup. So I got in the shower, but when I went to wash my hair, I realized that my conditioner was finished. I was pretty ticked off because I had only bought it a couple of days beforehand, and it's an expensive brand. My younger sister always uses up my things, so I knew that she had used it all. She had also trashed the bathroom, leaving water everywhere and her dirty towel on the floor. I was pissed off, and I was about to get out of the shower in order to tell her off and get some more conditioner. But as I went to get out, I realized at the last second that she'd kicked the grippy mat that we have at the bottom of our shower tub up. Our shower and tub is super slippery without the grip mat. So as I went to step out, before I could realize it, my foot slipped and I fell neck down onto the edge of my tub. Time seemed to slow down in my head. And I remember that my last thought was, wow, this is how I die? How stupid. But here's the thing. At the moment of impact, I woke up in a start back in my bed. I know it sounds stupid and cheesy like something from a dumb Netflix show, but there's literally no other way to describe what happened. I was lying in my bed right before I got up to shower the first time, but I don't remember falling asleep. And the thing is, I've been a lucid dreamer for the last five years or so. And if this was a dream, it was way more vivid than anything I have ever experienced. What really weirded me out though, was that the exact same friend who texted me the first time, messaged me after I woke up to tell me that the guy she'd had a crush on had asked another girl out and that she was really bummed out about it and didn't want to come to the party. 
I was weirded out that there was some similarity between that and the dream, but I didn't think about it much at first. As I went to reply, my younger brother came in to ask if I would take him to his friend's house. All the blood drained from my face. He just stood in the doorway looking confused and asked me what was wrong. I rushed to the bathroom, feeling like I was losing my freaking mind, and I went to check the conditioner bottle. I know this sounds completely crazy, but the bottle was finished just like before, and the grip mat was kicked up. At that point, I went back to lie down in bed and I texted my friends to tell them that I would not be going to the party. I'm pretty sure that I slipped in the shower, died, and then woke up in some alternate dimension. I know it sounds kind of crazy, but I really don't know how else to explain this series of events. In any case, it's rattled me ever since. So let me start with some background information first. My mom and dad have been serving as missionaries in Ecuador for many years and currently are serving in a spiritual stronghold in a small town on the coast. My parents, in all their years as missionaries, haven't encountered many paranormal or demonic experiences, but there was one out of two experiences that kind of freaked my dad out. This story began around the time that my brother was six and I was just a newborn. My dad was driving the family home when my mom wanted to pull over to a small shop that was owned by a woman. The woman was selling homemade household items, such as woven bread baskets, carved wooden sculptures, blankets, and things like that. My mom spotted a small doll that looked like an Otavalo woman, one of the indigenous people groups of Ecuador. She bought it and showed it to my dad. My dad wasn't too sure about the little doll when he first saw it. He got a weird feeling in his gut once we got back on the road. A few days later, my mom hung the little doll up in front of the kitchen sink window. My dad still had that feeling in his gut, but continued to ignore it. As the day turned into night, my dad woke up from his sleep and glanced at the clock. It was one o'clock in the morning and he decided to go to the kitchen to get a cold glass of water. As he entered the kitchen, he paused and stared at the little doll hanging in front of the window. The doll was totally still as it hung and stared back at him. My dad rolled his eyes and turned his back to open the fridge and get the jug of water. As he was getting his glass of water and was putting the jug back in the fridge, he glanced back at the doll and his heart almost stopped. The doll was swinging back and forth all by itself. There were no windows open or any air draft within the house. The house we lived in had no central air system like American houses do. We had air units in each bedroom along with ceiling fans. So there was no way that any air was making the doll swing back and forth. My dad was still in shock as he stared at this doll then the doll swinging started to pick up its pace, and then it started violently spinning around in circles. My dad thought it was going to fly off or break the string that it was hanging from. As the spinning around progressed, my dad remembered not to be afraid of such things, so he literally drank from his glass of water and walked out of the kitchen calmly, even though his heart was beating like crazy. He didn't want fear to be picked up by the doll, and so as he walked back to the bedroom where my mom was, he prayed and asked God for protection. He also checked on my brother and I before going to bed. The following morning, he told my mom what he experienced, and my mom was horrified. That very day, they took down the doll, prayed over it against any evil that might have been within it and wrapped it up in several plastic bags before throwing it away in the trash that was going to be taken out that day. Since that experience, my parents are much more careful with what they bring into their home. And if they do buy something like that, 
they pray over it to cast out any evil or demonic spirit that might be lurking inside. I've always been in tune with the paranormal since I was a little girl. My relatives tell me that I played hide-and-seek with my great-grandfather, two months after his passing. Unbeknownst to me, I was too little to understand death. Besides having contacts with the deceased throughout my life, I've also experienced prophetic dreams multiple times a week, mostly of ordinary events, like dreaming of having a conversation with my mother, and then having it play out a couple of weeks later exactly as I dreamed. Some of my other family members also share some particularities. My mother has foreseen pregnancies and cancers, and my cousin always dreams of people before meeting them. I considered all of this somewhat different, but not completely out of the ordinary. I never thought anything of it, except having the constant deja vu passing through me like a shockwave from events that play out exactly like in my dreams. Until one day, it all changed. And before I start, I would just like to say that this story is 100% true, and to this day, I don't know the complete truth behind it. In September of 2018, I saw a moth. Nothing unusual, just a regular moth that landed on my desk while I was studying for university. It was the most ordinary moth you could imagine, and I thought nothing of it until three days later, when I saw another one. Again, a regular moth with no distinguishable features just happened to enter my room and stay on the wall. And then again, a couple days later, I saw another one land close to me at the university. I would be walking on the street and see moths everywhere. Before September of 2018, I had seen maybe five moths in my entire life and then all of a sudden I saw five in one week. If it was only happening in my bedroom, I would assume something logical was going on, but they always seemed to follow me everywhere and land close to me, even at random places like the DMV. After a month of this madness, I had a random conversation with my grandmother about something completely unrelated. That's when she mentioned that her deceased mother-in-law, my great-grandmother, was a witch. Not a regular witch, but black magic type of witch. Now, my grandmother is not completely trustworthy since she does exaggerate absolutely everything she says. It could very well have been that she just had some incense and candles and my grandmother said she was sacrificing chickens to the devil or something. I was never able to figure out the truth of it since nobody in my family speaks of it. And the one person that does is not a completely reliable witness. But true or not, I started looking into witchcraft and paganism after this conversation, and I came across the symbolism of moths. One of them is spiritual transformation. And then it clicked in my head that maybe, just maybe, someone was trying to reach out to me, to guide me, to get me to research, to tell me that this is what my spiritual path is supposed to be. Maybe it was my great-grandmother trying to hold my hand and steer me in the right direction. Maybe you believe this and maybe you don't. All I know is that after this realization, the moths stopped. I went back to seeing them on a normal, regular basis. And when I do, I always greet them like old friends. And I thank them for the message. In 2013, I worked as a baker at a small cafe in central Arizona called the Wild Iris. It's still in business. It was a super old building, and it had a reputation for being haunted, at least among the staff. I was quite skeptical at the time about all things paranormal, but also curious. So I spent a week or so inquiring fellow co-workers about their experiences. 
I would hear stories from other bakers who would come in at 4 a.m., unable to get the lights to work until the 5 a.m. barista arrived. Other stories included things like rags flying off the countertops or moving around while people turned away. Creepy, but not convincing. I remember feeling compelled to have my own experience, and I felt energetically open to inviting something paranormal to happen. During that time, I was scheduled after hours with two other co-workers to dust the air ducts. We were instructed to throw tarps over everything so that the dust wouldn't dirty the workspaces. I was in the bakery, which was essentially a tiny workspace connected to the coffee area. I threw a large tarp over one of the rolling speed racks that was filled with empty squeeze bottles for caramel and chocolate sauces. Once I got to the top of my stepladder to begin dusting, I noticed a single squeeze bottle sitting on top of the tarp. There was no storage above the speed rack, so I had no idea how that bottle managed to get on top of the tarp I had just thrown over it. I was so baffled, and so were my coworkers. However, I wasn't convinced that it was a ghost. The next night, I was scheduled and told everybody about my experience. Eventually, it was just me and one other coworker, the barista, closing the shop. There was only one customer left on the opposite side of the room. I think it was a young man reading by the front door. We spent all night discussing paranormal things and really creeping ourselves out. It got to the point where I had to stop talking about these things with her because I was so unnerved by the energy we were stirring up. Shortly thereafter, I bent over to get a trash bag out of the cabinet beneath the sink when I heard a noise from behind and above me. It sounded like a woman's voice but a combination of a growl and spoken words, and it had texture. It was like nothing I've ever heard before. It was like somebody was speaking from another dimension, almost filled with static. I immediately froze and spent a few seconds trying to logically understand what I had just heard. I knew it wasn't the song playing on the radio, because it was much louder than that. I knew it wasn't my coworker behind me, but after finding no other explanation, I turned around to face her and said, What was that noise? My coworker looked at me and said, I thought it was you. We both froze in disbelief, and at the time, we were both equidistant from the espresso bar that had several coffee cups stacked on top. Neither of us could reach it. After a couple of seconds of just staring at each other, we both noticed something on top of the espresso bar moving, so we looked at the same time. One of the cups floated a couple of inches in the air, wiggled a bit from side to side, and then lowered itself back down. We both looked at each other to confirm what we had just seen, and ran to the bathroom on the side of the building, laughing hysterically, flooded with adrenaline. I was so utterly in awe of what had just happened, I remember saying out loud, Okay, I get it now. I believe you. Not the scariest thing ever. But to this day, it remains the most bizarre and unexplainable thing I've ever witnessed. This story is real. First off, my whole life, I've been a tad perceptive. Not psychic, but just aware. I can feel energy. That feeling you get when your body tells you to run or fight. That feeling in your stomach, hundreds of knots at once. A true scare. I got that today, at work. I'd been working on a house in Palos Verdes. It's beachfront country in Southern California. We're taking down the garage to the studs. I can tell you that whatever is in this house was furious about it. Banging, knocks, catching figures out of the corner of your vision, disembodied voices, and just that feeling. There were only two of us there. I'm pretty big, so I can tear stuff down pretty easily. The guy I'm working with was wearing wireless headphones, so he couldn't really hear the things that I did. Whenever I would hear something, I would say, you didn't hear that? He would just shake his head. I don't really know the history of this house. The family living there is currently living somewhere else while we remodel. It's just day two, 
and I'm already starting to get freaked out. We started finishing up, putting all the tools away, and then I hear it. It sounded like something terrible was happening to someone. It was just a horrible scream. Even my partner heard it this time. Now do you hear it? I asked. He gave me a stern look and said, Why do you think I brought headphones? We both started to laugh nervously. I started to wonder because this is daytime. Why are they so prevalent? And if any of you were like pics or it didn't happen, I get that. It sounds strange, but it did happen and I was really scared. I didn't want to make things worse. I was already worried that we were basically destroying the spirit's place. I think homes have memories. They remember energy. I could feel it. Look, believe what you want. I'm not here to change minds or force ideas onto you. I just wanted to tell this story. We still have a few days left on this project. I'm wondering if anybody else has had experiences like this on site. Day 2. Hey, I'm just posting this update. We came back. Last night I had nightmares about zombies eating me, so there was that. I don't know what that means, if anything, but it was horrifying and unusual. I dreaded coming to the house. We opened the locked door to access the rest of the remodel. Now, I always lock up super tight because I have a lot of tools, but when we walked in today, my stuff had been thrown everywhere. I was furious, thinking kids had gotten in and stolen my stuff. I looked around and there were two windows boarded up solid with thick plywood an inch thick, probably ten screws in each. Both were still boarded up solid. And then came the confusion, trying to figure out what was taken, but nothing was missing. It was just all thrown around on the ground. It's funny, we didn't think to take a picture until after we had cleaned it all up. Today I will keep my eyes open for more activity. I just want to get done with this as soon as possible.